Hi. Officer, if she does happen to come up that way, you'll give me a break, right? See him pass you, right?
time marriage. She's in the 40 minutes. She's already in, guys, on the other side. So we are going to open up a um, second room on the second floor. It's 2203, which is in the um, exact corner of this building. So they'll be setting it up in about five minutes and have it ready. No, we have to shut the doors when the, you see it from upstairs. On, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have these TV screens up there, and there's seats. Let the chairman arrive.
The committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers. It is our job to work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is our mission, 
And today's hearing follows one of the most important parts of that mission. With $1.5 billion spent by the Secret Service, nearly a billion of that spent on protection of the first family, the second family, former presidents and presidential candidates, the United States Secret Service was always considered to be the elite law enforcement agency made up of men and women who were highly regarded, highly respected, and highly trusted. The country has placed great faith and trust in the Secret Service. The agents of the Uniformed Division, their officers, and the Secret Service agents have a monumental task, that of protecting the nation's presidents past, present, and future. They do so honorably and not without considerable personal sacrifice. They ensure the safety of the first and second family, yes, and the safety of foreign dignitaries throughout Washington and at times around the world. They ensure the safety of every man and woman who enters the White House and accompanying buildings. But a history of misbehavior, security failures, has clearly blemished that record. On September 19th, Omar Gonzalez jumped the north fence, ran across the White House lawn, up the steps of the North Protocol, and into the front door of the White House. He was armed with a three-inch serrated knife. He entered through an unlocked door, passed the staircase to the presidential rem residence, and into the East Room of the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the part of my opening statement that was changed last night when the early false report that, in fact, he had been apprehended just inside the front door was turned upside down by a revelation that, in fact, he penetrated much further into the White House. Secret Service officers only subdued him after he was clearly well inside the White House. An intruder walked in the front door of the White House, and that is unacceptable. Common sense tells us that there were a series of security failures, not an instance of praiseworthy restraint. Inexplicably, Omar Gonzalez breached at least five rings of security on September 19th. The White House is supposed to be one of America's most secure facilities, and in fact, one of the world's most secure facilities. So how on earth did it happen? This failure was once again tested, has tested the trust of the American people in the Secret Service, a trust we clearly de depend on to protect the President. After allowing a paparazzi-crazed reality TV star to crash a state dinner, after engaging prostitutes in Cartagena, after excessive drinking and an agent falling asleep outside his room in the Netherlands, and yes, after the mishandling of the 11-11-11 event, a gunman who sprayed bullets across the White House and it is reported caused over $100,000 in damage that was not properly reported in real time or understood in real time, it is understandable that morale at the uh, agency appears to be in decline, according to news reports. In light of, of the recent break-in, we have to ask whether the culture at the Secret Service and possible declining morale have an impact in operation, and those are some of our questions today. The appointment of Director Pearson brought new hope that the agency would reclaim its noble Im in image. But recent events have so troubled us that, in fact, we have called the director here to face some tough questions. How could Mr. Gonzalez scale the fence? We understand that. That happens often. People try to scale that fence. But how is it that, as would ordinarily happen, agents didn't immediately apprehend him? 
How was he able to sprint 70 yards, almost the entire length of a football field, without being intercepted by guards inside the fence? Why didn't security dogs stop him in his tracks? What about the SWAT team and assault rifles or uh, sniper rifles? Why was there no guard stationed at the front door of the White House? And yes, how much would it cost to lock the front door of the White House? The Secret Service must show us how there is a clear path back to public trust. The purpose of today's hearing is to gain answers to these many questions plaguing the, sec the Secret Service. Today we will hear from experts on both, a on both the agency's protocol, foreign and domestic. But more in most importantly, we will hear from the Secret Service Director herself on her plans to improve the agency's performance. Americans face real danger as we serve interest abroad, especially those stationed at our embassies. It is a time of great peril. We are engaged in a battle against ISIL as we speak. But that is not limited to foreign soil. Americans know that the next attempt to take the White House may not be by a crazed, solo, uh, knife-wielding veteran with PTSD. It could well be a planned attack from a terrorist organization. The fact is, the system broke down on September 19, as it did when the Salahis crashed the state dinner in 2009, as it did when Ortega Hernandez successfully shot the White House on November 11, 2011, as it did in Cartagena when agents paid for prostitutes and compromised security as it did in the Netherlands in 2014. We cannot further allow this. But more importantly, as I said to the Director before today's hearing, the Secret Service relies on two important skills, or facts. Their skill, their capability to protect the President must be at the highest level because they cannot f succeed 99 percent because 1 percent failure is not an option. But they also rely on a good faith belief by most people that they shouldn't even try, that this is the hardest target on earth. We need to make sure that that second hardest target on earth is true again, both in reality and in the minds of anyone who might take on the Secret Service to get to the President of the First Family. And with that, I recognize the Ranking Member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We begin today's hearing with an obvious premise. No individual should be allowed to scale the fence of the White House, sprint across the North Lawn, and burst into the residence of the First Family with a weapon. No one. Our goal today is also clear, to determine how this happened and make sure it never happens again. This is our watch. This recent incident, unfortunately, causes many people to ask whether there is a much broader problem with the Secret Service. Last night, The Washington Post reported that Omar Gonzalez made his way into the East Room much further than the Secret Service previously disclosed. Another report in this weekend's post about a shooting incident in 2011 raises even more questions about the competency and culture of this elite agency. What concerns me most about this report is that agents said they were hesitant. Agents in this agency said they were hesitant to raise security concerns with their supervisors. Ladies and gentlemen, something is awfully wrong with that picture. The Secret Service is supposed to be the most elite protective force in the world. Yet, four days went by before they discovered that the White House had been shot seven times. Then in 2012, there was the prostitution scandal in Colombia. 
Although it had little to do with tactical protection issues, it seriously damaged the agency's credibility. The Secret Service must not only carry out its duties with the highest degree of excellence and effectiveness, but it also must maintain a reputation which matches that performance. As the chairman has said, much of what deters people from trying to pierce the protective veil of the Secret Service is the reputation. And that reputation was, must be one of excellence and effectiveness. Today's witness, Ms. Julia Pearson, was appointed as the director of the Secret Service last year to help restore the agency's standing. She has had a distinguished 30-year career with the agency. And to her credit, she immediately ordered an internal review and agreed to testify. With respect to the recent, most recent incident, I have key questions for the director that I know are shared by many people across the country. Did the Secret Service have specific protocols for handling this type of perimeter breach? If so, were those protocols followed in this case? And if they were followed, do they need to be changed in light of what happened? If the protocols were not followed, why were they not followed? And how can we have confidence that they will be followed in the future? I also want to understand what happened prior to the incident. Gonzalez was arrested in Virginia two months earlier on July 19th. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record an inventory sheet that was provided to us by the Virginia State Police. It lists the contents of this car, which included an, an arsenal of 11 firearms, including sniper rifles and a sawed-off shotgun. It also, without objection, the entire report be placed in the record. Thank you very much. It also included the contents of his car, which included a small arsenal of 11 firearms, including sniper rifles and a sawed-off shotgun. It also included a map of Washington, D.C., with, and I quote, a line drawn to the White House. According to the Virginia State Police, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives concluded that there was no information in Gonzalez's history that prohibited him from owning these firearms. Yet, he was severely mentally ill, and a military psychiatrist reportedly treated him for post-traumatic stress disorder and paranoid schizophrenia. Mr. Chairman, I hate to even imagine what could have happened if Gonzalez had been carrying a gun instead of a knife when he burst inside the White House. That possibility is extremely unsettling. Today, our work faces two challenges. First, the Secret Service has not yet completed its internal review. I understand that the director will provide us with a status update, but the final results are not yet in. Second, some of the information is classified, so we cannot discuss it in public. The very last thing we want to do is give people like Gonzalez a roadmap for how to attack the president or other officials protected by the Secret Service. This does not mean the committee cannot obtain the information. The director sent a letter on Friday offering not only to testify here today in the public setting, but also to provide all of us with a classified briefing. The chairman has now agreed to hold this classified session in a separate room directly after this hearing concludes. Let me close by making this very final point. This, ladies and gentlemen, is not a Democratic issue. This is not a Republican issue. This is an American issue. This is also an issue of national security. The vast majority of men who serve and women who serve in the Secret Service are dedicated, experienced public servants who are willing to lay down their lives for their country. And on behalf of a grateful Congress and a grateful nation, I thank every one of them. They have an extremely difficult job. And like others in similar positions, they are required to make instant 
life or death decisions in extremely stressful situations. Last year, for example, the Capitol Police shot and killed an unarmed woman with a one-year-old girl in the back seat of her car. Some praised their quick responses, others criticized their actions, but they acted based upon their firsthand experience right here in the Capitol when another deranged individual burst through the doors and killed two Capitol Police officers. The Secret Service has a high profile job, but it is critically important and it requires accountability so that the spotlight is rightly on their actions today. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the testimony. I thank you for bringing us back for this hearing. And uh, I look forward to the questions that I've already raised and others being answered. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. I now recognize the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, uh, the chair, subcommittee chairman on national security, uh, for his opening statement. I thank the chairman, and, uh, and I, I also thank the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, in his statement. He's absolutely right. This is not a Republican issue, a Democrat issue. This is an American issue. I don't want it to be the political football, but we in the United States of America are self-critical. It's one of the beauties of our nation is we do hold ourselves accountable, and so I appreciate, Chairman, you holding this hearing. We have wonderful men and women who serve this nation. They do it patriotically. They do it, they put their lives in line. They walk away from their families and their spouses. They don't know what the day is going to bring them, and they do so in a very, very honorable way, and we thank them for their service and their dedication. But I have serious concerns about the current leadership. I have concerns about training, and I have concerns about protocol, and that's what I want to get at today. Since the current director uh, has taken on this role, it's also important to note that she was the chief of staff since 2008. And so over the last several years, it's not good enough to just simply excuse this as something we were trying to clean up before because she was the chief of staff starting in 2008. I'm concerned about her leadership and the mixed messages that are sent to those that serve in the Secret Service. For instance, after the fence jumping incident, the Secret Service was very quickly, very quick to put out a statement that, that honored the, the officers and agents for their, quote, tremendous restraint. Tremendous restraint is not what we're looking for. Tremendous restraint is not the goal and the objective. It sends a very mixed message. The message should be overwhelming force. If one person can hop that wall, hop that fence, and run unimpeded all the way into an open door at the White House, don't praise them for, for tremendous restraint. That's not the goal. That's not, the, that's not what we're looking for. If there were alarms that were inside the door that were muted or silenced, I want to know why that is. Who makes that call and decision? That, to me, is a leadership decision. I think at some point we need to go back and review the 2013 Inspector General's report, which actually said there's not a problem here, but has over a thousand indications of security concerns. In the opening statement, say we have to be 100% right all the time. Everybody agrees with that. And yet the Inspector General's report is pretty damning when it comes and looks at how many, what the agents are feeling like happens within the, in the agency itself. Very concerned about the 2011 incident. I'm thankful for the Washington Post and Carol Ennig and what she did in the reporting there. As best I can tell from the spot report as well as the, the article in the Washington Post, the event in 2011 where eight shots were fired at the White House, you had no less than five Secret Service agents report that they thought they heard shots fired. You had somebody on Twitter report that they saw somebody shoot at the White House. There were two people in two different shuttle vans who reported that they saw somebody firing a weapon at the White House. Blocks away, moments later, somebody crashes a vehicle, an assault rifle is in there, and yet the, and the Secret Service is on the scene, and nobody ties those two together. I don't understand that. Later, the Arlington County Police actually detained this person. He had been positively identified based on what with that vehicle was there, but nobody put it into the system to put him on the watch list. Consequently, when the Arlington County Police pull him over, they take his picture and they let him go. And it was only the Pennsylvania police, five days later, that actually find this person. Now he's serving some 25 years in jail, but he could have done a lot more damage. If the director is truly, truly going to take full responsibility, I think your opening statement and the goals you have should also talk about leadership. Because as I talk to the whistleblowers at the Secret Service and others, 
They're concerned about leadership. I'm also concerned about training. As I look at the 2015 budget request from the White House, on page 39, there's a basic class totals, and I want to run through these numbers because it's important on the training aspect. Under special agent basic classes, in 2009, there were eight classes. In 2010, there were eight classes. In 2011, there were five classes. 2012, there were no classes. In 2013, there was one class. In the uniform division basic class, 2009, 11. 2010, there were 11 classes. 2000, sorry, 2010, 11 classes. In 2011, there were six classes. Then in 2012, there was one class. 2013, one class. And you look at the budget line appropriation for this, it didn't go down. It was, it's maintained basically the same. Why did that training diminish? And then finally, Mr. Chairman, I worry about protocol. Again, I mentioned tremendous restraint is what the, what the Secret Service touted. That's not the objective. If you project weakness, it invites attacks. We want to see overwhelming force. If a would-be intruder cannot be stopped by a dog or intercepted by a person, perhaps more lethal force is necessary. And I want those Secret Service agents and officers to know at least this member of Congress has their back. Don't let somebody get close to the president. Don't let somebody get close to his family. Don't let them get in the White House, ever. And if they have to take action that's lethal, I will have their back. In this day and age of ISIL and terrorists and IEDs and dirty bombs, we don't know what's going on underneath that person's clothing. If they want to penetrate that, they need to know that they are going to perhaps be killed. That's the message we should be sending every single time. And that's the kind of secret service that I expect. I thank them again for their, their service, their dedication. We love them, we care for them, but we need better leadership. It's not happening. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for her opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this hearing. My respect for the, civil, for the Secret Service goes back to when I was growing up as a child in the District of Columbia and continues profoundly to this very day. But today, uh, we must ask, uh, recent events are called for and, and uh, recent unprecedented events call for an unprecedented, an unprecedented response. First, uh, an increasing number of White House jumpers, including the most recent this month, who was able to get deep into the interior of the White House. Before that, in 2011, multiple shots into the living quarters of the first family, discovered only four days later not by Secret Service investigation, uh, but by White House staff. Beyond these failures in the core mission of the, of the Secret Service uh, to protect the White House and the First Family is uh, an unsettling failure to disclose, perhaps even understand what has occurred, or to promptly investigate. Together, this combination of failures suggest strongly that the time is ripe for a 21st century makeover of the Secret Service. I do not regard this matter as a mere question of personnel. I believe it goes far deeper than that. Moreover, the stunning events have occurred during a period when the United States, and by definition the White House and even the President, are being targeted by domestic and international terrorists. According to threat assessments, this president has had three times as many threats as his predecessors. Just as troubling have been indications of unwarranted secrecy in the Secret Service. The Secret Service is not a secret society if there is a willing avoidance of needed transparency, that in itself poses a danger to the White House. For example, when noise is heard that some believe could be gunfire at the White House, others believe uh, is automobile backfire, and still others believe is gun, gun, gang gunfire, 
isn't it the job of the Secret Service to presume, presume such a sound is gunfire until an immediate investigation shows it was not. When line officers close to the sound have to become whistleblowers, has active suppression of information become yet another threat to the White House? Worse, do such failures show that some in the Secret Service are in denial of danger, perhaps posing the greatest risk to the White House. Particularly troubling, in light of such unanswered questions, would be the rush to quick fixes, such as suppression of public access to the area around the White House without a thorough investigation. The White House and Lafayette Park, just like the Congress, are first a minute areas, and the public must be allowed to express their grievances as they always have been. In light of the seriousness of recent, recent breaches, the investigation at the first instance by the Department of Homeland Security should go well beyond the details of these events. They are merely the most recent raw data for a top to bottom investigation of Secret Service operations at the White House. This is not a mere question of personnel. Changing people at the top or in between will not solve the issue I think we are presented. We must learn whether today's Secret Service as structured, for example, could stop five or six fence jumpers jumping at the same time, intent on harm to the White House and the President, not just a demented war vet who even alone might have succeeded. At uh, no, no scenario should be off the table for the needed 21st century study of Secret Service operations in the age of terrorism. Uh, Director Pearson has shown accomplishments in her 18 months as director. The heroism of the Secret Service is beyond debate. The White House intruder was brought down, after all, by an agent. But the White House and the President have been thrust into a new era of danger. The Secret Service should welcome an outside investigation to assure that the necessary resources and the expert backup and the structure for the 21st century is necessary for it to do its job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. Members may have seven days to submit opening statements for the records. I now ask unanimous consent that our colleague, the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, be allowed to participate in today's hearing without objection, so ordered. Additionally, I ask unanimous consent that our colleague, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Long, be allowed to participate in today's hearing without objection, so ordered. We now welcome our panel of witnesses. The Honorable Julia Pearson is the Director of the United States Secret Service. The Honorable Ralph Basham is the former Director of the United States Secret Service and currently a partner at Command Consulting Group. The Honorable Todd Keel is the former Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Protection at the United States Department of Homeland Security and is currently a senior advisor to Touchstone Page. Pursuant to the committee's rules, I would ask that you please all rise and raise your right hand to take the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. 
In order to allow sufficient time for discussion and questions, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Your entire opening statement will be made a permanent part of the record. And with that, Director Pearson is recognized. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, distinguished members of the committee. I'm here today to address the concern that we all share following the incident of September 19th at the White House. It's clear that our security plan was not properly executed. This is unacceptable, and I take full responsibility, and I will make sure that it does not happen again. As director, my primary concern is ensuring the operational readiness of my workforce. I have been aggressive in addressing our human capital challenges, ensuring professionalism, and developing leaders. Through active engagement with the agency's supervisors and employees, I have made it clear my expectations for professionalism and personal accountability. Much of what we do to protect the President and the White House involves information that is highly sensitive or classified, so I'll be limited in what I can say in a public hearing. On September 19th, the man scaled the north fence of the White House, crossed the lawn while ignoring verbal commands from uniformed division officers, entered the, through the front door, and was subsequently arrested on the state floor. Immediately that night, I ordered enhancements around the complex and, in consultation with a secretary, initiated a comprehensive review of the incident and protective measures to ensure this will not happen again. The review began with a physical assessment of the site and personnel interviews. All decisions made that evening are being evaluated, including those on tactics and use of force in light of the totality of the circumstances confronting those officers. I am committed to the following a complete and thorough investigations of the facts of this incident, a complete and thorough review of all policies, procedures, protocols in place that govern the security of the White House complex, and a response to this incident, and based on the results of that review, a coordinated, informed effort to make any and all adjustments to include training and personnel actions that are necessary to properly ensure the safety and security of the President and the First Family and the White House. The White House emergency action plans are multifaceted and tailored to each threat. The Secret Service has apprehended 16 individuals who have jumped the fence over the last five years, including six this year alone. In fact, on September 11, 2014, a week prior to the events that are the subject of today's hearing, officers apprehended an individual seconds after he scaled the fence and ran onto the grounds. In addition to fence jumpers, over the last five years, hundreds of individuals have approached the White House perimeter verbalizing threats to our protectees or acting in a suspicious manner. Officers and agents routinely leverage their experience and training to make decisions to either arrest or transfer these individuals to appropriate facilities for mental health evaluations. Protecting the White House complex is a challenge in any threat environment. In addition to being a national icon, the complex consists of public spaces, executive offices where our nation's highest leaders congregate, and the private residence of the president and first family. Ensuring the safety of all who live and work in the White House while preserving access to the millions of visitors each year requires a unique balance. In this environment, we are never satisfied by the status quo, and we're constantly reviewing our security protocols. With the help of Congress, we have enhanced our protective countermeasures and security features at the White House. In the past five years, the Secret Service has upgraded perimeter cameras, officer booths, vehicle gates, and command and control systems, along with enhancements to highly classified programs that have made the President and the complex more secure. We have generated many of these new security enhancements in direct response to intelligence information on known and emerging terrorist tactics. I thank the Congress for their support in this time of constrained resources. Beyond technology, approximately 75 percent of our annual budget is dedicated to payroll costs which support our most valuable asset, our people. The agency relies heavily on experience, training, and judgment of our men and women to make critical split-second decisions. With respect to the many questions that have been raised and the opinions proffered in the wake of the September 19th incident, I do not want to get ahead of the investigation that is underway. The Secret Service has had its share of challenges in recent years, and some during my tenure. I intend to lead the Secret Service through these challenges and restore our agency's reputation to the level of excellence that the American public expects. As director, I'm proud of the Secret Service's workforce who serve each day with honor and distinction. Last week, our employees successfully implemented security operations in conjunction with the 69th United Nations General Assembly in New York City, where they protected the president and more than 140 world leaders. Over the last 12 months, they have completed over 5,600 successful successful protective missions. 
It is my responsibility to ensure that these men and women have the resources and training that they need to succeed. As director, I have worked with the Department of Homeland Security, the Se Secretary Johnson, the administration, and Congress to include members of this committee to develop a comprehensive forward-leaning strategy to further enhance the Secret Service's workforce and operational capabilities. We remain dedicated and committed to protecting the President, the First Family, and the sanctity of the White House. I thank the committee today for the opportunity to appear, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Basham. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Cummings. Uh, could uh, you turn the mic on and pull it a little closer, please? Try that. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Ranking Member uh, uh, Cummings, um, distinguished members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share my perspective today on the recent event at the White House and more broadly on the state of an agency I care a great deal about, the United States Secret Service. Let me say at the outset that I look forward to discussing how the recent incident, uh, incident highlights some of the challenges the Secret Service has, has long faced at the White House complex in balancing desired levels of security along with the functional needs of those who work and live in that complex, the practical realities of the thriving city it resides in, within and the historic symbolism and imagery of the People's House. The incident exposes certain steps the Secret Service got right and those they got wrong, and will identify corrective measures and additional resources that can be considered. However, it also poses some difficult re uh, questions for all of us on issues, like the use of uh, lethal force and our tolerance for uh, additional uh, fortifications around the White House complex. Those questions do not have easy answers, and the long-term potential consequences must be thought through. Let us also be mindful that while our analysis of actions and shortcomings has the benefit of days of hindsight and consideration, anyone who has served on a protective detail knows the decision making in an actual event with life and death consequences is measured in milliseconds. Those who were on duty that, uh, during this incident had a much harder job in trying to get it right than we do here today. My perspective is one that is shaped by a career of over 30 years in the Secret Service but also from my experiences at the head of three other operational components within the Department of Homeland Security. And now from five years in the private sector, where I remain deeply involved uh, in the Homeland Security issues and the implementation of international best practices as it relates to the protection of individuals and high value assets. I had the honor of joining the Secret Service in 1971, and I, had enjoyed, I enjoyed a challenging and very interesting career including being on protective details of Henry Kissinger, Vice President Bush, Quayle, Gore, and countless foreign heads of state and foreign dignitaries. Later, President Clinton appointed me as the director of the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. And eventually I returned to Washington after the September 11th attacks to help start up the Transportation Security Administration. I rejoined the Secret Service in 2003 when I was appointed director, where I was honored to serve for over three years. I subsequently was appointed by President Bush to serve as a commissioner of the United States Customs and Border Protection, uh, the largest law enforcement agency in the United States. I remained in that position into the Obama administration at the request of Secretary Napolitano. Upon retiring from the government in 2009, I helped found a security company that worked for private, sec uh, worked for private sector and government clients. Therefore, the viewpoint that I will share on the subject before the committee today is informed largely by my experience with the Secret Service, but with the benefit of having worked for and with many other elite security organizations around the world for almost 40 years. Let me commend this, uh, the members of this committee for the time and interest you are showing on this subject, especially at this juncture when there are so many pressing security concerns to which our government must pay attention. It goes without saying that the recent incident with the individual jumping the uh, White House fence running across the North Lawn and making it inside the White House uh, is unprecedented and unacceptable. This is not just my view, but as the director has stated, it is the, her view and other senior management of that agency as well as the rank and file. Again, perspective is critically important in this incident. We could easily be sitting here today discussing why an Iraq veteran, possibly suffering through post-traumatic stress disorder, armed with only a pocket knife, was shot dead on the North Lawn when the president and first family were not on the property. At the Secret Service, some of the split-second decisions made during this latest incident will thoroughly be examined 
Procedures will be debated, training will be altered, and in the end, the Secret Service will learn valuable lessons, as they have been doing throughout their history, of protecting the President and his family. This is an agency which has never been reluctant in, to red team incidents, those of high consequences and those of less uh, importance, to find opportunities for improvement in the way it conducts its business, the way it trains its people, and the tools it uses to accomplish its incredibly important mission. I can tell you that my confidence remains extremely high that this aspect of the services culture remains as strong today as it has ever been. And I know that the agency will learn valuable lessons that it can apply immediately to improve security at the White House and in other settings. I would urge the committee to keep in mind that when examining any incidents, that, that, that the broader context in which the Secret Service operates is not one which is valued on security alone. The service has to ensure that the President, other protectees, and facilities in which they work and live are safe and secure. But they do so in the context of important American values like freedom and openness. And in close coordination, cooperation, and almost always after negotiation with a myriad of other stakeholders and decision makers who have diverse priorities, responsibilities, and viewpoints. And this dynamic, uh, this dy dynamic is, in fact, more true when it comes to the area surrounding the White House complex than in any other. As much as I may have wished it when I was the director, the Secret Service absolutely cannot unilaterally when it comes to the, almost any security feature in uh, around in, in around the White House. Stakeholders with a voice include the government of the District of Columbia, as Ms. Uh, Norton would uh, recognize, the National Park Service, White House Historical Society, GSA, and others who all provide input into an architectural, any architectural changes and improvements new infrastructure or changes in appearance. A prime example of this is the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House to vehicular traffic. A security imperative for the service for, for, uh, from the service's perspective for many years uh, that was po uh, politically impossible until Oklahoma City bombing in 1995 uh, made the impact to a, they made the impact to a vehicle-borne explosive could have on a government building, no less a 200-year-old sandstone mansion made it very vivid and undeniable. Even then, it was not until 2004 when I was director that we were able to complete the project to permanently converting this portion of the road into a pedestrian mall. I might add to this day, there are those who believe the avenue should be reopened in spite of the overwhelming and irrefutable evidence of the extreme risk such a move would put the first family and hundreds of employees who work there. I can also tell you that there have been numerous studies conducted over the years by the Secret Service and at the Secret Service's request to test and explore options to address vulnerabilities of concern at the White House uh, complex, motivated in part by concerns about the inadequacy of the current White House fence as an outer perimeter for a complex given the uh, ability of an individual or group of individuals to quickly scale it and be on the White House grounds. While notable improvements have been made, especially over the last decade, to the security of the White House complex, many unnoticeable to the public, there have been several priority improvements desired by the service that have not been possible in light of other considerations or given the level of funding provided to the agency for such capital improvements. Let me be clear. I am not in any way trivializing the importance of these other considerations. As a security professional, there have almost always, there are almost always being things that I would like to do for security purposes, but could not given the factors or, or, uh, and limited uh, funding. And that is always going to be the case. We must always keep in mind that the White House, like the, the United States Capitol, is an important symbol of, for the American people. It is obviously critically important that it be kept safe, but that security must be accomplished in a way that does not jeopardize the very values that we seek to protect and that these buildings themselves indeed symbolize. I ask that you keep, in, keep this in context when looking at this particular incident and examining how some could have, uh, some, something could have happened or how it could be and should be prevented in the future. Finally, I want to make sure that the committee is aware of another fundamental principle on which the Secret Service, in fact, any good security organization's protective methodology is based. In the military, it's called defense in depth. But in law enforcement, it is usually referred to as multi-layered security. When it comes to protecting the President or the White House complex, 
There are many layers of protection through which an attacker must travel in order to achieve their desired objectives and to pose an ultimate threat to the person or thing that is the target. A breach of the fence and the entry of an individual into the White House Mr. is Basham, undeniably Mr. Basham, acceptable. Could you, could you summarize your at twice five minutes? Oh, oh I apologize. Uh, then having said that, Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Kyle. Thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of the committee for inviting me to testify today regarding the U.S. Secret Service's uh, security protocols. I believe I can offer a unique perspective on protecting high visibility targeted facilities after spending nearly 23 years as a special agent with the U.S. Department of State's Diplomatic Security Service with responsibility for developing and implementing security programs for U.S. personnel, embassies, consulates, and other official facilities around the world. I've also spent numerous years in the private sector working in and advising corporate security operations and management. Additionally, from late 2009 until early 2012, I was the Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Protection at the Department of Homeland Security. As the Assistant Secretary, I was responsible for public-private partnerships and a regulatory program to protect the critical assets of the United States. Last year, I was also selected and served on the Benghazi Accountability Review Board recommended independent panel on best practices, which is, was, was established to identify best practices from across U.S. government agencies, the private sector, non-governmental organizations, and allied countries on management and operations in high threat, high risk locations globally. Mr. Chairman, the United States Secret Service has a proud history of almost 150 years protecting the most important government leaders of our country, the White House and other official facilities, and conducting criminal investigations to ensure the integrity of our currency, banking systems, and financial communications and cybersecurity. The men and women of the Secret Service are on the front line every day keeping our nation safe, and they do a tremendous job. The agents and officers of the Secret Service are constantly in the spotlight, especially serving at the White House, one of the most prominent symbols of our nation's strength and democracy, and we owe them a debt of gratitude for their service to our country. However, every organization, even those with a century and a half of history, must be willing to learn. Those who wish to do us harm from an unpredictable, lone, possibly mentally unstable person to an organized terror group intent on unleashing a calculated attack typically have the element of surprise. Our country today faces a very dynamic, fluid and evolving threat environment in which the aggressors have become very patient, resilient, and determined. We have to be better than they are. To counter this threat, security, intelligence, and law enforcement agencies like the Secret Service must have solid strategic and tactical management and leadership, focus on their primary mission, and provide their people with the best training and resources, and possibly most important, be ready to act aggressively and appropriately when faced with a threat. The Secret Service, like any successful organization, must be willing to continuously evolve and improve to adapt the agency ahead of the threat curve. Throughout my career, I found that government agencies and private sector organizations who are at the top of their game become complacent. Time tends to unknowingly erode and blunt the pointy end of the spear, and organizations and their management teams rely on, this is the way we've always done it, or we know how to do it best, so they're unwilling or unable to change. The Secret Service, I believe, would benefit from expanded use of new and emerging technologies to assist with its protective security responsibilities. In fact, when I was at the Department of Homeland Security, the Secret Service partnered with my office and the DHS Office of Science and Technology to research and develop cutting-edge technology for use at major events in the United States. Now is the time for the Department of Homeland Security to bring some of those technological enhancements out of the lab and expand their use in the Secret Service toolkit. In addition to emerging technology, management and leadership of an organization must adapt, change, and improve. Policies and procedures and deployment of personnel and resources should be under constant scrutiny and exercise based on real world scenarios. The officers and agents of the Secret Service are some of the best this country has to offer, and they deserve the strategic and tactical leadership to match. All too often, Mr. Chairman, after something has gone wrong, the cry is simply for more money, more personnel, and a larger physical setback. This is rarely the correct answer. Absent a comprehensive understanding of the fundamental issues that led to systematic failures, 
throwing more money and people at the problem will only exacerbate existing management weaknesses and compound and magnify rather than correct management challenges. Internal reviews post-incident are typical in the U.S. government from agency to agency, but from my experience, these reviews are impacted by intentional or unintentional personal and professional bias and are often informed by the same agency cultural and management gaps that may have been a contributing factor in the original incident. The Department of Homeland Security and the Secret Service now have a unique opportunity and critical moment in time to obtain an unbiased, independent, top-to-bottom review focusing on the service's management and policies and procedures related to the incident on September 19th and other similar incidents. I strongly recommend that the Secretary of Homeland Security appoint a panel of external, independent experts to conduct this review, and this group should be tasked with providing advice, guidance, and formal recommendations to DHS and the Secret Service. In fact, Mr. Chairman, the panel I was on on Benghazi was chaired by former Secret Service Director Mark Sullivan. Mr. Chairman, throughout my career, I've always been proud to work side by side with my Secret Service colleagues at every level in the agency. The United States Secret Service is a recognized world-class organization, and I'm confident they will learn from this most recent and related incidents and innovate, strengthen, and improve as they keep our country and leaders safe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kyle. I'll recognize myself now. And I think the first question, if you can put out the map of the White House up there. The first question, if, uh, Director, if you look at the lower portion, uh, the first question the American people want to know was, is there a crash button, and had it been pushed, would it have locked the front door, uh, the, what's marked as the entrance hall? The front door at the time did not have an automatic locking mechanism. It required an, an individual to hand lock the door. Okay. So we have an automated system that can lock down the White House. $800 million a year, millions of dollars more the la during your tenure each year than the President's request, and that door was unlocked with no one standing at it when Mr. Gonzalez came through it. Is that correct? The door was unlocked at the time of Mr. Gonzalez's entry. That's correct. Okay. And earlier, there was a report and in the indictment of Mr. Gonzalez that he was apprehended at the entrance hall. Isn't it true today that we understand that is not true? He was actually apprehended at the green room. Is that correct? If I may clarify my first answer, the front door actually consists of two doors. There's an outer door, which is a glass almost described as a storm door and an inner door, which would be a wood, ornamental, historic door. The outer door, the glass storm door, was not locked. The internal wood door was in the process of being hand-locked. Okay. Bottom line is, automated locking is a capability within the White House, but not at that entrance at that time. Not at that time, but it has since been installed and is effective today. We learn from our mistakes. The second question, your agency previously had reported, and an indictment against Mr. Gonzalez asserted that he was arrested in that entry area. Isn't it true that he actually penetrated the cross hall, the east room, and in fact was arrested in the vicinity of the green room? Uh, referring to your map on the wall, yes. as I have been briefed, the Mr. Gonzalez entered the front double doors. Ma'am, I want a short answer. I have very little time. Was he, in fact, the federal complaint said he was, he was yes. in fact, apprehended in one place. Isn't it true he was apprehended further into the White House? As Mr. Gonzalez entered the door, he knocked back the officer that was standing at the doorway. The officer then engaged Mr. Gonzalez. They crossed the east entrance hall together, made the left turn down the cross hall. They stepped momentarily into the east room. Another officer rendered aid, and he was placed on the ground, on the carpet, and handcuffed on the cross wall hall just outside of the green room. There is okay. no indication so, so in fact, the So, in fact, the federal complaint and the earlier reports were not accurate. Is that correct? Yes or no, please? I think the original complaint is accurate that Mr. Gonzalez scaled the fence. 
Ma'am, ma'am, hold it, hold it. I, I have very little time, and I'm not, I, I, the, the American people want to know if there is a president safe. I want to know if we can rely on reports from your agency. Now, going back to Mr. Hernandez, during your watch, not as director, but as chief of staff to the director, is it true that, in fact, as reported, agents falsely assumed that they were not gunshots when they were gunshots, that, in fact, there were stand-down orders to people who had already pulled shotguns out, that, in fact, those, the bullets were not discovered to have hit the White House in real time within a 24-hour or greater period by the Secret Service? Yes or no, please? Mr. Chairman, you're referring to the Ortega shooting that occurred the or yes. in November Ortega 11, Hernandez, 2011. Yes. At that time, it is my understanding that there was reports of shots being fired in proximity to Constitution Avenue. Ma'am, ma'am, I, ma'am, ma'am, no, States stop, States please. Service. I want to be considerate to you. You have a hard job. But you head an agency whose morale has gone down. It is lower than other comparable federal agencies. It has had a series of embarrassments. We're going to leave the embarrassments out. We've had two cases in which the reporting is evolving. Only last night did the public learn that, in fact, it was far worse, or at least somewhat worse, on uh, September 19th. Only recently have, has it been revealed, and you, you said you wanted to correct the record. The Washington Post makes it clear, from what I read, that, in fact, on November 11th of 2011, shots were fired, the assailant left, well, in fact, the Secret Service supervisor shut down the response of people who believed rightfully there had been shots fired, and, in fact, the follow-up did not discover the damage to the White House and, and, and the actual shots in real time. Additionally, Mr. Ortega, Ortega Hernandez is the way I have it written, uh, would not have been apprehended except that he had a car accident. And even when he was, it was not immediately linked to his criminal activity. That, in fact, the system at the White House did not detect the actual shots fired and begin the pursuit of somebody who had provided lethal force against the facility of the White House. Is that correct? You were chief of staff at the time. Is that roughly correct? And if it isn't, I allow you the t whatever time you need to properly explain what really happened on November 11, 2011, so the American people can understand that September 19 is not the first time there has been considerable lapse, as I see it, and, in fact, during a long period of time, during your chief of staff time, now during your director time, we have had the kinds of things that we should be concerned about for protecting the President. So please tell us, in whatever time you need, about November 11, 2011, where the Washington Post is right or wrong. This is your chance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you are aware, my assignment as Chief of Staff... And uh, could, you, could you get the microphone a little closer, please? Certainly. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. As you are aware, in uh, 2008, my assignment with the United States Secret Service was Chief of Staff. My primary responsibilities at that time were business transformation and IT transformation for the organization. My focus was on the business operations of the organization. To my knowledge, and based on the briefings that I have received of this three-year-old investigation that occurred in November of 2011 that appeared in the uh, Washington Post on Sunday, uh, I had also been aware that uh, uh, Representative Chaffetz had asked for a data inquiry, and we responded back to the committee on September 12th and provided him detailed information of the Secret Service's activities on that weekend. Uh, shots were reported by the United States Secret Service officers in the area of Constitution Avenue and 15th. There were witness accounts of a black vehicle uh, that had fired shots. There was confusion at the time by the part of the witnesses as to what they had witnessed and what they had saw. Several of those witnesses put out Twitter accounts of what they had witnessed. They were subsequently located and interviewed and recanted those statements. The actual shots that were fired uh, in proximity to the Constitution Avenue and 16th, the vehicle sped away. 
and went westbound on Constitution, erratically driving, and struck a light post in the area of 23rd and Constitution. Mr. Ortega then fled the vehicle. Park police officers and uniform division officers ultimately responded to the scene where the vehicle was left with the AK-47 in the front seat. Park police has jurisdiction over the traffic accident and assumed responsibility for the initial phases of the investigation. Ma'am, I'm going to give you all the time you need, and I thank the ranking member, but the answer is where are the inconsistencies with what we now know from the Washington Post? You said that, that they got the story wrong, they were misstating it, they were mischaracterizing it. I'd like to hear the inconsistencies. So far, you're just corroborating that, in fact, the understanding of the series of failures in real time to protect the White House are, in fact, correct, according to the Washington Post. So please tell us where they're not correct, please. Throughout the course of this, there was a, a command post established down at Constitution Avenue and 23rd Street, Metropolitan Police Department, the U.S. Park Police, the United States Secret Service were there attempting to resolve or understand from the witness accounts what had happened along Constitution Avenue. Back at the White House, Individuals had heard what they believed to be shots. The Secret Service, according to the records that I have been able to locate on this three-year-old investigation, did respond properly. Uh, the emergency response teams and other officers did a protective sweep of the area to make sure that we did not have any intruders, to make sure that there were not in, you know, injuries and obvious signs of anything that had been damaged. Uh, further investigation with the Park Police, they were unable to resolve at that time as to whether or not these were shots being fired at other vehicles or shots being fired at the White House. That took some time to, to understand. It wasn't until uh, the, the, the uh, usher's office was preparing for the return of the President and First Family or the President and the First Lady that they identified damage on the Truman Balcony. That led to further investigation, and that led to us contacting the Federal Bureau of Investigation to initiate their full investigation. Thank you. Mr. Cummings, I want to thank you for your understanding and, and just relate something that you and I discussed uh, yesterday, if I may. It, it, in Washington, D.C. and around the country, there are a number of systems that we all know, and Baltimore, I believe, has it too, that uh, they are basically microphones that hear gunshots can identify the direction, can quickly, without human intervention, figure out whether or not a real shot has been fired, confirm it, and often give a very accurate direction. That type of technology isn't so odd that we don't see it in our cities. Uh, and I think that's the reason I went on so long with this question. Uh, Ms. Norton, I know, knows this. The district does have a sophisticated system, and I think the committee is going to want to make sure that not only does the White House have a higher level of, of awareness of this system, but that the district system be enhanced if necessary to make sure that something like this never happens, happens again. And I thank the gentleman for his patience. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Pearson, um, I have thought about all of this long and hard. And I think my major concern goes to the culture. It is very disturbing to know that Secret Service agents in the most elite protective agency in the world feel more comfortable, apparently, from what I'm hearing, coming to members of this committee and telling things than coming to you and members in the agency. That, that, I'm telling you, when I boil all of this down, that to me is dangerous. It, go, it has to go against morale. I don't even see how good decisions can be made if your own people don't feel a level of comfort that or they feel fear that they are going to be able to talk about the things that concern them. And that's, I, I just want to go through some questions and I want you to, I want to give you a chance to address that because to me, that when we, when all the dust settles, that's a problem. And so going back to this November 11th, 2011 incident, and I know you were not 
the direction. I, I understand that. Um, a lot of people talk about the cultural problem with the Secret Service and the re press reports, of all the press reports, the one that was concerned me is, and is, is that back down in 2011, it, and it said, I quote, it, quote one of the officers, officers who were on the scene who thought gunfire had probably hit the house that night were largely ignored. And some were afraid to dispute their boss's conclusions. Did you see that report and are you aware of this issue? Ranking Member Cummings, I too read that newspaper article and was troubled by those accounts. I have asked my Office of Professional Responsibility to retrieve the file and those records, uh, what we know and when we knew it, if this young officer had made such a statement. I did find a statement that where this young officer alleges that they were um, re reluctant to report it to their supervisor to be criticized, I believe was a statement. That troubles me as well. And that's a major problem. I'm going to ask my Office of Professional Responsibility to re-interview that officer. They remain on the job today to, de to determine whether or not that officer would be more confident today or what were some of the problems that night that she felt like she could not say that. That extremely troubles me. Now, it said that she heard shots, and I quote, she heard shots and what she thought was debris falling overhead. She drew her handgun and took cover then heard a radio call reporting possible shots fired near the south ground. She then called the Secret Service Joint Operations Center to report that she was breaking into the gun box near her post, pulling out a shotgun. According to this article, and I quote, she replaced the buckshot inside with a more powerful slug in case she needed to engage an, atta an attacker. But then the call came over the radio to stand down. The next day, the officer, and I quote, listened during roll call before her shift Saturday afternoon as, advise as supervisors explained that the gunshots were from people in two cars shooting at each other. The report said that she, and I quote, had told several senior officers Friday night that she thought the house had been hit. But on Saturday, she did not challenge her supervisors for fear of being criticized, she later told investigators. Now, Director Pearson, as a former field agent and as the head of the agency, that has to concern you tremendously, is that right? Yes, sir, it does. It's unacceptable. Does it trouble you that some of your own agents apparently do not feel comfortable raising security concerns? And, th and, and, and this is just one person. And there are others who, again, would rather be whistleblowers. And again, I have no problem with whistleblowers. Matter of fact, we do everything in our power to protect them. But this agency, if they'd rather be a whistleblower than to, to, to bring their concerns to you. I, see, you, you, you started off by saying that you're going to make sure this never happens again. Let me, let me tell you what, what the problem is here. If, if, you, if you're heading an agency where the folks can, are not providing you with the information to do the right thing, to make the changes. How do you even know what the problems are? You, you follow me? Help me with this. Yes, sir, if I may. Anytime, any organization, you start to make significant changes. Some people will have resistance. Some will push back. However, I will continue to lead and transform the Secret Service to ensure that we're prepared to, for our mission and ensure that we can restore our reputation to the American public. What I will tell you, over the last 18 months I've been serving as director, and over the last six months I have met personally with over 1,500 of our supervisors and employees. 
I've had a number of engagement se sessions and spent over an hour with each of them, expecting, advising them of what my expectations are, what their performance requirements are, what personal accountability is, how to manage this workforce, how to ensure that we are performing at the highest levels in everything that we do, that we're operationally ready, that we're training, that we're evaluating each other, and that we're constantly looking at our mission to make sure we're being effective in everything we do. I can't speak for what has happened in the past, but I can tell you as we're moving forward into the future, and while I am as director, I will not tolerate in personnel missteps where people either fail to act or do not support the workforce or do not work in unison. But I would say that I suspect there are many people that are still pushing back and I'm going to continue to lead forward. You know, the, the problem is that that officer, she was right. And that was the morning after the shooting, yet it took four days for the housekeepers to discover that the bullets had struck the building. Isn't that right? In other words, the, the, the officer was right. Yes, ultimately the officer was right. The Washington Post, Post story says that this agent subsequently reported her concerns to investigators. Was there an after-action report about the 2011 shooting? Did it include recommendations relating to agents reporting their concerns without fear of being criticized? Do you know? I don't know, but I would say that the officer's statement to our interviews that occurred with Secret Service employees are different than the officer's statement to the FBI and the investigators conducting the investigation. And that is why I have asked my Office of Professional Responsibility to go back and have a robust conversation with that employee to ensure that she feels supported, uh, knows that we, are, we want her to come forward with any information, and that we understand what some of the impediments may be with the management team where we feel like we can make improvements to ensure that it never happens again. Let me say this, and then I'll, I'll close. Um, former Director Sullivan invited me a few years ago, I, you may have been there, to speak before your top agents uh, when, after the Columbia situation uh, with the prostitutes. And one of the things that I said to them back then I expressed my tremendous respect and appreciation, but I also told them that I don't want anyone to imagine, imagine, imagining that they can pierce the protective veil of the Secret Service, period. Because I, I firmly believe that the reputation is so very, 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 very important and, you know, I just, I just, again, that culture thing is an issue. I'm sure others will question you about that. But uh, I, 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 I just uh, thank you for your testimony. I yield back. Thank you. And I'll recognize myself following up on Ranking Member Cummings. I sent you a letter, Director, specifically asking for details about the situation on 2011. I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into the record so all members can see it the unclassified spot report on the incidents in, in November uh, of 2011. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Director, why is it, why is it that when I look at this report, there isn't even a mention of Officer Carrie Johnson, and yet the Washington Post reports details about her calling into the Secret Service headquarters? Why isn't her name even mentioned in the spot report? The spot report reflects the active investigation. I don't know what information that you have relative to Officer Johnson's uh, reporting. Well, you gave us this report. I asked you for all the details and information. This is minute by minute, 2052, 2052 hours, 2053. It's minute by minute what happened in this situation. Are you telling me that the Washington Post is wrong, that she didn't call into the headquarters? Did she not do that? I'm confused by your statement about call in to headquarters. Well, according to the Washington Post, she called in and reported that she had heard shots fired. She, she reported that she was opening a box, getting out a shotgun, all those details. 
that's the uh, confusion that I have with the Washington Post I article. Typically, when there is an emergency happening around the White House or alerts are made, much like the shots being fired on November 11th, I would expect officers to react according to their security protocols. And she says in the Washington Post, it, it says that she called into the headquarters. There's no mention of that. Other officers are mentioned in there, but she's not off. We'll, we will follow up on that. It's unacceptable to not even mention that the actions that she took and that the Washington Post could get that, but the Congress couldn't, and you couldn't provide it. Let's go back to the fence jumping situation. State to police, the fence jumper. State police had detained a person, had a map in the car, all the weapons that Congressman Cummings had talked about, suspicious behavior. My understanding is that it actually three officers had actually spotted him that day and not reported it, not reported it. And I want to know if that's true as we go along. The fence failed. Officers uh, chased him, didn't catch him. Sniper was in position. No shots were fired. Dogs were out there, weren't released. Counter surveillance, I'm understanding, is understaffed. There was no shoot. Nobody shot anything. There was nobody that was intercepted. The doors were unlocked. An officer was overwhelmed. A crash box was evidently silenced. And yet the Secret Service puts out a statement that says that they offered, quote, tremendous restraint and discipline, end quote. My question to you is, do, do those officers have your authority to use lethal force to prevent somebody from entering the White House? Those officers do have the authority to use independent judgment to leverage lethal force when appropriate. Is that true when somebody's trying to get at the president? That is always true. They are law enforcement officers. So it's always true when there's somebody's trying to penetrate the White House that they can use lethal force? As appropriate within the confounds of the law. Is somebody trying to explain the details of that? If somebody is approaching the White House, has penetrated the security and making a run for the White House, no apparent weapon, can they take that person down? The law requires that law enforcement officers ensure that they are in imminent danger or others are in imminent danger before they can leverage lethal force. So if the person's running at the White House, but no apparent weapon, they can or cannot use lethal force? Those are going to be independent decisions made by the officer based on the totality of the circumstances. How does an officer know if they have an improvised explosive device or dirty bomb or, or if it's a terrorist? How do they know that? Isn't, shouldn't they assume that this person has ill intention? Law enforcement officers are trained in observation skills, and I would assess that they are constantly looking at people for ill intentions. I, I think it's confusing. This is, part of, this is part of what they have to deal with. They make a split-second decision. I want it to be crystal clear. You make a run and a dash to the White House, we're going to take you down. I want overwhelming force. Would you disagree with me? I do want our officers and agents to execute appropriate force for anyone attempting to challenge or breach the White House. We've got to explore this further. The, White, uh, the uh, Secret Service put out a statement, uh, according to the, uh, uh, or talked to the Associated Press, I should say. They, they reported it uh, on September 20th at 1.24 a.m. Eastern Time. Donovan, the spokesperson, uh, Ed Donovan. Donovan said the man appeared to be unarmed to officers who supported who spotted him climbing the fence, and his search of the subject turned up no weapon. Why would he say that there's no weapon? I will have to, have, a, have to ask Mr. Donovan that question. You haven't done that since the incident happened? I know when Mr. Gonzalez was placed into custody, he was found to have a folded knife in his right front pants pocket. Do you consider that a weapon? That is a weapon. Why would the Secret Service put out an official press release saying that, or, or put out a statement to the Associated Press? Did you ever correct the, did you correct the Associated Press? Did you call them back and say, you got that wrong? I have no knowledge of that. So you just let it linger out there that there was no weapon. That was wrong. It was inaccurate. Correct? I do know that there has been a lot of information in this case, and that's why we are, we are doing a robust review. I can't speak for conversations that I was not a part of or the press's interest in this. Did you read the press release before it went out? 
I have read the press release before it went out. Do you agree that the officers showed tremendous restraint and discipline? You agreed with that comment? I do think based on the totality of the circumstances and from Mr. Gonzalez's arrest that these officers did use restraint in making a very difficult decision as to whether to deploy lethal force or subdue and arrest him. Do you think they responded appropriately? I do not think the security plan was properly executed and that is why I'm conducting a robust investigation to ensure that we have a comprehensive review of what people were, th that I have the facts, all of the facts, so I can make an assessment of what the decisions were on that night. Thank you. I've gone well past my time. We'll now recognize the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia. Pardon me. We're going we're gonna to recognize Mr. Horsford. Is he here? Go ahead. We'll, we'll go to, to, to Ms. Ms. Norton. Be recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank Director Pearson for her 30 years of service in the Secret Service for rising through the ranks to become the first woman director. Uh, and I am aware of what she has inherited and of uh, her many accomplishments. Uh, Director Pearson, uh, I want to ask you about uh, the rumors that have been out there about what the Secret Service may do. Uh, when Pennsylvania Avenue was closed down after Oklahoma C uh, a City, there was a kind of uh, example of how public access can remain. Uh, I, was, uh, I was heartbroken. Both sides of the White House were closed down. I worked with the Clinton administration to open E Street, uh, the back side of the White House. Uh, that not only for its vista, but because it's a major thoroughfare and it affected the entire region. region. That was merrily closed down. But as Mr. Balsham uh, testified, uh, in front of the White House, though cars can no longer go there, people can go there. And essentially it was made a park, a walkway. Um, and I, none of my constituents, no one says it should be reopened because that would mean cars, not people. So my concern is whether or not people will continue to have access around the White House. I walked to the White House yesterday. Uh, I was pleased to find not only tourists, but protesters uh, as usual there. Uh, I ask you, uh, I noticed that on, I followed your testimony and you testified 16 jumpers in only five years. Um, so there's been an increase in, in fence jumpers. And so I want to know whether you have considered before today simply uh, asking that a higher fence be built one that, for example, could curve, you know, still be historic, that wrought iron fence, but with the curves going outwards, so maybe you damage one of your body parts if you try to get over it. Um, or even, and here, I, these are off the top of my head, multi-layered glass behind the fence uh, that could resist um, um, blasts from guns or bombs. Uh, have, have, since there have been 16 in five years, uh, at least I think uh, many more over the years, have you considered such common sense devices as that so that the public would still have access, but the President of the United States and his family uh, would be protected? Have you ever recommended that? Representative Norton, we do want to work in partnership uh, to ensure that the people have access in proximity to the White House and the historic nature and the national significance of the Lafayette Park and Pennsylvania Avenue and the, in the White House. And so I do look forward to continuing to work with you and the administration and the department to look at what additional security features can be put in place not only to, uh, for White House fence jumpers, 
but for the other challenges that face us in securing public areas. I recognize that most of these fence, fence jumpers are harmless. I am worried about multiple fence jumpers uh, and whether you have the, the resources and the staff, if there were five or six of them, would come across the fence. Come across the fence. Uh, by my calculations, you are down uh, almost 300, more than 250 agents in the uniformed services in the last year or, so, or two since the sequester and the cuts. Is that the case? Yes, uh, Representative Norton. There, the Secret Service has had a reduction in its staffing as a result of sequestration and other uh, fiscal constraints. We are close to 550 employees below our optimal level. Do you have, uh, do, are you, are you, do you have to, I understand that staff has had to be brought in uh, from other units who may not as, have been as familiar with the White House because of the shortage of staff. Is that the case? Earlier this summer, and based upon the work requirement that the Secret Service is faced with in the month of September in order to support the United Nations General Assembly, I made the decision to bring in special agents from around the country to support some of the Uniform Division posting assignments in proximity to the White House tours. That's provided some relief for our Uniform Division to be able to take some annual leave. Yeah, oh, Mr. Chairman, I realize my time is, 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 is gone, but I do think that Congress has to take some responsibility when the sequester went across the board, including police agencies like, this, like the Secret Service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlewoman. We'll now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director, I'm actually a big fan of law enforcement, um, and I don't take any delight in asking the questions I'm going to ask you, but law enforcement are given unique powers in our society, and with those unique powers come unique responsibilities. And I can't think of any responsibility greater than guarding the safety and security of our President and his family. So as I understand it, uh, several agents believe that shots were fired, and a supervisor concluded that it was a vehicle backfiring. Um, even if that were true, given the very small investment of resources, why not investigate the shots fired? Uh, Representative, I think that is where some of the confusion starts to come out is the story that's in the Washington Post. First. I'm not asking you about a Washington Post story. I'm asking you about why a housekeeper who doesn't go to Glencoe, who doesn't spend 14 weeks in training, who doesn't have 18 weeks of training thereafter, found glass, and your agents did not. That didn't come from the Washington Post. Is that true? Did, did a housekeeper find evidence of, of, of the shooting and your agents did not? The housekeeper was able to locate uh, fragments of glass on the Truman balcony, which is not an area that is frequented by uh, security personnel. And I didn't ask you about who was frequent. I asked you, there, there was a, a spontaneous conclusion that shots were fired. There were officers who believed they smelled gunpowder. There were, uh, your officers drew their weapons, Director. That's how seriously they took it. So I'm not interested in cursory searches. When did your agency find evidence of the shooting? I believe it was on the 15th or 14th of November. Which was how many days after the shooting? Three to four days later. All right, so you have, you have, an officer contemporaneous with the shooting believing that shots were fired. You have officers taking cover because they believe shots were fired. You have officers at the White House drawing their weapons because they believe shots were fired. Now give me all the evidence to support a vehicle backfiring. Representative, I am sure your familiarity with law enforcement in downtown areas, there is sound attenuation. Oftentimes, Equinox I've never heard a car backfire six to eight times, I Director, not, ever. Have you? I've heard car backfires, but I don't think... Six to eight times. I think it's undisputed that there were witnesses that observed shots being fired. Right, and it is also undisputed that a housekeeper who doesn't train at Glencoe, who doesn't have 18 weeks of intensive training, found the evidence of the shooting, and your agency did not. And, and, and I, I'm going to give you credit because you didn't bring it up. It was brought up by, by a colleague. I have some colleagues who are just obsessed with sequestration. 
We can't have any hearing without it coming up. But you're not going to sit there and tell us that sequestration is the reason your agency did not find evidence of the shooting, are you? No, I am not. Okay. I, and I give you credit for that. Uh, and I was stunned that one of my colleagues would try to uh, conflate, uh, to use the Attorney General's word, sequestration with the fact that a law enforcement agency waited four or five days to find evidence of a shooting that a housekeeper found. So give me all the evidence to back the vehicle backfiring narrative because we already know all the evidence to support the shooting. Give me all the evidence that made you, your department, so sure that it was a vehicle backfiring that you didn't even search the White House. The Secret Service was actively engaged with the United States Park Police in an effort to determine where and what direction the shots were fired on Constitution Avenue. Uh, Madam, Madam Director, Ma Madam Director, you, you reached the conclusion that it was a vehicle backfiring as opposed to shots fired. Now, this is the third time I've asked. Give me all the evidence to support that supervisor's conclusion that it was not shots fired, despite all the contemporaneous claims that it was, and despite all of the reaction of your agents that it was, give me all the evidence to support the theory that it was a vehicle backfiring. And then tell me, why not invest the very minimal resources required to exhaustively search the White House? Representative, Oftentimes in these cases, there are a number of different people that make different statements. What I can tell you is that uniformed division officers on Constitution Avenue heard gunfire and reported gunfire. I can't speak to the specificity of the individual you're talking about that reported it as... Well, can you speak to why it, a housekeeper found it and your department did not? Housekeepers routinely work in the, the private residence of the president and first family. It so e even when there is overwhelming, let's just say suspicion that shots were fired, we won't say overwhelming evidence because that would have required you to search the premises. Overwhelming suspicion of shots fired, and you don't go through every inch of that residence? I want you to, I want you to imagine a prosecutor is in front of a jury, Madam Director, because this is where sometimes these cases wind up, and you explain to the jury why a housekeeper found evidence of the shooting and your agency did not. Representative, again, this case has been prosecuted in federal court, and those explanations were made before a federal prosecutor. And thank the Lord they were, the, the explanations were sufficient for a jury. Now, I want you to make them sufficient for Congress. The initial shooting incident occurred at 9.30 at night. It's difficult to see at night. How about here? Officers Can you hear at night? Officers heard the shots fired on Constitution Avenue. Officers reacted, picked up security positions, swept the area looking for any type of injury, any type of intruder. It was not known until days later that these shots had actually struck the upper level, the third floor level of the White House. Okay, I'm going to end because I'm out of town with the same question that I began with. Why not search every inch of the White House, given the very small investment of resources? I mean, I went on your website, and I saw that you have training for psychology. You have training for survival skills, none of which I minimize, all of which I'm sure are very important. This is just processing a crime scene, Director. This is not high math. It is processing a crime scene. You actually don't need 18 weeks of training to be able to do that. You just need to walk around. So why wasn't it done? It is my understanding that a perimeter sweep was done. Was it as thorough as it needed to be? Evidently not. not. Gentlemen, Evidently gentlemen, not. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, the ranking member of our subcommittee on national security, Mr. Tierney, for seven minutes. Thank you. Well, thank all the witnesses here this morning. Um, Director, I want to talk a little bit about preventions. If we look back in July, several months before the incident where the perimeter was breached and uh, Mr. Gonzalez went into the White House, uh, it's our information that he was stopped by the Virginia State Police, uh, and in his car they found at least 11 weapons and a map uh, with a line drawn directly to the White House. Is that your understanding as well? It was a regional map with a line pointed to the uh, memorial area of the mall, including the White House and the other historic monuments. And our reports are also that the uh, Virginia State Police uh, and the ATF 
then refer that matter to the Secret Service because, presumably, because of that line. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. correct. So Secret Service, based on that, then had an interview with Mr. Gonzalez at that time. Um, is that also correct? Yes, the case was later referred to the Secret Service for an interview of Mr. Gonzalez. Right. Now, what would the, how thorough would that interview have been according to your protocols? How deep would they have gone into their examination of Mr. Gonzalez and his history? They had a very thorough initial interview with Mr. Gonzalez and initiated contacts with his family members, his mental health history, and the police reports. So they determined that he had a mental health history? He acknowledged that he had a mental health history as a veteran suffering from PTSD. And do your protocols allow you to then look at his records, to obtain his records, or is that not something you can do? If the individual consents to the release of their medical records, we do pursue that. And in this case, Mr. Gonzalez consented to the release of his military medical records. So you had all of his medical records to review. I presume you, your agents did review them? They were obtained over a period of time, and we have received them, and they have been reviewed. And despite all of that, uh, what happened? I mean, you didn't take any action. You didn't have him uh, arrested. You didn't have him continue to be under observation, did you? Representative, it's a very difficult thing for people dealing with disabilities and people dealing with mental illness when they don't exhibit any unusual direction of interest in our protectees. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, at the time, denied any interest or any intent to harm anyone. He indicated that his information relative to the map in his car was given to him by another individual who had recommended places in Washington, D.C. to sightsee and that he intended to go to uh, on camping trips and wanted to go to the Valley Forge, Pennsylvania area. Was the individual whom you said uh, gave him that map ever questioned? Not to my knowledge. How does that comport with your protocols and your procedures? I know our, investigation, our investigators are as thorough as they possibly can be in investigations like this to make sure that we have a good understanding of Mr. So Gonzalez. So your testimony of the individual wasn't available for some reason? I do not know the specifics of that, but I can get back with you. I wish you would, because I think that would be an indication of whether or not they really were as thorough as they should have been. All right. On that, now, notwithstanding that, there was a second incident before the perimeter was breached by Mr. Gonzalez and he went into the White House, where he was found walking in front of the White House with a hatchet uh, in his belt. Is that correct? Mr. Gonzalez was observed on August 25th on the South Fence Line. And he was interviewed again by Secret Service agents? He was interviewed by uniformed division officers. Of the Secret Service? Of the Secret Service and uh, special agents of the Secret Service. And his name was run against a, a database? Yes, his name was run against a database. And the database refer, uh, re re or, uh, basically indicated the earlier incident, right? Yes, the database provided information of the original contact with Mr. Gonzalez. So at that time, they knew he had been arrested in Virginia, had a map pointing towards the area of the White House, had ammunition in his car, was now found outside the White House walking with a hatchet. We knew he had mental health problems. His records had been reviewed. What happened then? Officers and agents made contact with Mr. Gonzalez, advised, asked him about the hatchet that he was carrying. He indicated that he had been camping in the area of like Prince William County down around Quantico. The agents and officers, officers had asked him for consent search of his vehicle. He agreed and was going to return the hatchet to the vehicle. They went back. They looked through the vehicle. Mr. Mr. Gonzalez was extremely cooperative, dispelled any concerns that the uh, officers had. He had camping gear and camping equipment in his car. He appeared to be living out of his car. And so they just let him go. Mr. Gonzalez had not violated any laws, and he had to be released. Did they have any follow-up? Did anybody talk to any other agencies in the Washington area about observing uh, this individual or making sure that somebody knew what his behavior was after that second incident? That information, the second incident, was also passed into our analysis desk so that it could be evaluated in context to our first contact with Mr. Gonzalez in July. And what happened at the end of that evaluation? What was the recommendation? They, they had not committed any violations. Had nothing that uh, his, he was under mental health evaluations by both the, the military VA 
and that no further action could be taken by the Secret Service other than to continue to monitor his behavior through his family. Well, is that the only way they could monitor is through his family? There was no other uh, indication there was any law enforcement activity that could monitor his behavior? He was currently on bond pending the charges from the state police and the incident th that brought him to our attention. Um, so here was some criminal conduct on the state level that he was, was still being addressed and that he was returning to that area. The case was still under evaluation as to what uh, Mr. Gonzalez's mental history was and whether or not he was going to come to our attention again. And is it your understanding that you thought it was particularly appropriate that the Social Security Service did nothing else in regard to making sure that this individual was monitoring his behavior? No. I, what I'm trying to reflect, Representative, it's very difficult for the Secret Service when these individuals come to our attention. Uh, as many as 300 a year or, or a day are being evaluated by our Office of Prote uh, Protective Intelligence. Um, are those 300 all have a history of twice being um, picked up with weapons uh, in a situation would put you in question that they were in proximity or heading to a proximity of the White House? No, but many of them are brought to our attention for either having an unusual direction of interest or making a direct threat against our protectees. They are mentally ill. Many of them have uh, long mental health, health paths. Uh, some of them are more cooperative than others, but in the specific case of Mr. Gonzalez, he was being very cooperative. His family had uh, been contacted by investigators. The family members indicated that he was cooperative, that he did not have a violent past. Um, his mental health records, to my understanding, as I've been briefed, did not reflect that any of his mental health in, uh, contacts referred him as being a danger to himself or others. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time. I thank the gentleman. I, one follow-up to that. It's my understanding, people have told us, that there were three different officers that had seen him, recognized him, the day that the, the incident happened, but did not report it. Is that true or not true? It is my understanding, based on how I've been briefed, that two of the officers recognized Mr. Gonzalez uh, in the area of the White House on, on September 19th and observed him for some time. They had remembered him from his, the contact they had had with him on 20, uh, August 25th when he was on the south fence line. They observed him for some time. He wasn't acting inappropriately. He didn't violate any laws. But they, you, they, did not re, they did not report that and they did not approach him, correct? I think they noted that, but they did not approach him. And they didn't report it? Not to my knowledge. Now recognize uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. I, I think there's several concerns, and I think one of the things that I agree just wholeheartedly with with the ranking member is, is this is, is something that both Republicans and Democrats, this is, the, we're talking about the White House. It's not a national icon, as you said, it's a world icon. Everyone you think of America, you think of the White House. And one of the concerns that I have, and, and was we've been mentioning many of the issues here recently on uh, just different events going on, is the issue is not the protocols that have been put in place now and how they wasn't done. It's the issues of why are there seemingly so many instances on a foundational level? Because if we don't start back at the foundational, why there doesn't seem to be a willingness to report? Why there doesn't seem to be a willingness to exercise, you know, a, a willingness to say this is something that I've noticed I don't, is, is the uh, officer said she didn't feel that she could report up line. If there's other issues where you're having the instances described in overseas and other places, there seems to be a foundational issue that we've got to address in, in these, not only from your perspective, but from hearings. And there are several things that I want to address. You just you made a statement just a moment ago that it was curious because you said in the, in the matter of one sentence, you said we get 300 uh, suspicious people a year and 300 a day in the same sentence. Which is it? Let me correct myself. First. In talking to our Protective Intelligence Division, as of yesterday, they were directly overseeing 327 investigations. Okay. So, so in, in totality, we're looking at 327 at this point. Question I have is you said that you're still making a review, but it is our under, it is understanding it's been reported, and it's also very visual, as my uh, colleague from uh, the District of Columbia has pointed out. There's already been a new fence or perimeter, a police line perimeter put in front of the White House. Is that correct? We have put up a temporary bicycle yes no. rack, rack to provide us with some standoff area to the fence while this investigation is underway. Ms. Pearson, it, 
that was, I, I thank you for the long answer to yes, but I'm trying, I've got several things that I want to have because I think they're important here. Because you've made several comments that we're doing an investigation, we're, we're saying why these protocols were not were breached, how they got there further, but yet you also said we don't want to rush to change or we don't want to change things, but yet we've already started with putting a, a perimeter fence or at least a barrier now uh, back from the fence currently. I'm, I'm wondering here if is the problem doesn't seem to be the fence. The problem seems to be the fact that someone jumped the fence, run 70 yards, went into the White House with nobody uh, stopping them. You made a comment. I also have, from my background, my father is in law enforcement, so this is hard for me in looking at this, but you made an analogy just a few moments ago that I'm not sure should be accurate here. You talk about discretion and, and restraint. Discretion and restraint in the way you encompass it is that police officers do this all the time. They do so on the side of the road when they've made a stop. You're talking about officers who are protecting a national icon. When they jump the fence, there should be an immediate understanding this person should not be here, and there should be an immediate understanding that there is not a restraint factor here. This is not the, the nice, cuddly secret service that you've got on our property. Let's move you back off. Someone running at the... At, I'm having trouble how you correlate restraint and discretion in a traffic situation, which is the way it came across, to someone actually going after the president's home. Representative, I have stated that they did not properly execute the security protocols that are appropriate to respond to. Do you believe because that is because of information or, or guidance that they have gotten from the top that they were not sure what to do? Have they been told to exercise restraint in these measures, or they have been told to exercise protection? Those officers have the authority to take legal uh, law enforcement action as individuals. I am conducting an investigation to find out what were the decisions that were made, what are the facts, in the totality of the circumstances that those officers saw. Mr. Scott, I, I, want to, I, want to, I want to give Ms. Pearson a break here with just that because this issue of, of putting the fence line in front or at least a police barrier and looking at this uh, area, I think we've got, again, we're, we're trying to make ourselves appear better as we're working on it. I, I seem to, as, as, as hard as that is to say, this president and his family deserve to be protected. It's very concerning to me that they were not told even about the shooting till many days later. That's just mind-boggling to me for this president and his wife to have to deal with that, especially when their daughter was actually in the residence that night. Oh, with, um, go ahead. Go ahead. I, do, I do have a, a question. Scott. Explain to me, is, is putting the fence, is this the only fix here? I mean, we've not heard from anybody else. I, tell me out here, is there a better way to go about this? Sir, from my perspective, uh, protecting U.S. embassies around the world, as Mr. Basham even pointed out, it's, it's a concentric ring of security, layered security. Uh, the, the fence typically is one of the last things, and typically fences are meant to keep good people out. Bad people find ways over fences. So you can't simply rely on a fence to be your, your last okay. resort. Uh, Mr. I, I think the issue that has come as we go forward here is the protection of this a not just a national icon but a world icon in the threat environment in which we're in. It's very concerning that we get half truths to start with, more truths. It's just a leaking out. When this is a group here that truly want to say what is the issue here and why are we not doing it in the proper way. And simply putting up a visual, we're doing something, is not right. The foundation's got to be laid, and over the past few years, the Secret Service has a foundational problem, and I think that's your bigger issue here, along with protocols not being followed. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield. I thank the gentleman. Uh, as we go to Mr. Lynch, I just want to make sure one thing was clear. Uh, Director, the failure to apprehend Mr. Gonzalez before he got well into the White House, the change of, of, of further setback or fence, since you successfully stopped 16 jumpers in the last five years, you said that in your opening testimony, was there any reason that you couldn't have stopped 17? In other words, you're taking the American people's space with this additional fence and, and the proposal for a setback that would include uh, Pennsylvania and, uh, and Lafayette being restricted, and yet you've made no case here today that you couldn't have had 17 out of 17 apprehensions if not for outright human error and procedural failures. Isn't that true? The placing of the bike rack to provide a buffer zone for the fence is to allow us time to do this analysis to make sure that our personnel and our procedures are going to be effective with the time constraints that the individuals have to be able to affect 
an effective tactical response to runners or fence jumpers. Okay, I, I guess I get it that you are not up to snuff to the level you would like to be, and until you are sure you are, you want to have that extra time. I, I sort of get that, but I have to be honest, that is a little concerning. Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the witnesses. Uh, Madam Director, I want to go over uh, again the prior contacts between Mr. Gonzalez and, and the Secret Service. Uh, as my colleague, Mr. Tierney, noted, there was a prior contact uh, with Mr. Gonzalez back in July 2014. He had been pulled over, and he had a small arsenal of weapons in, in the car. And I, I, just, I just want to try to explore, when does the red flag come up for the Secret Service? So uh, the Secret Service was informed that he had uh, 11 weapons in the car. And I just want to go over the, I have the evidence list from the state police that was provided to the Secret Service. Um, Mr. Gonzalez had a Moss, Mossberg Maverick Model 88 12 gauge pump service uh, shotgun in the car. He had uh, a Springfield Armory 308 Winchester with a scope and a bipod. Uh, he had an Adler uh, Italy um, uh, Jagger AP85 with a red dot scope in the car. He had a TriStar 12 gauge shotgun. Uh, in the car. He had an AR-15, which is a uh, pretty sophisticated weapon uh, with the flashlight and scope. Uh, he had a Weatherby Vanguard 270 caliber uh, bolt-action rifle with a scope and a bipod. He had a Smith & Wesson's 380, uh, 380 caliber automatic black uh, uh, handgun. He had a Glock 45 in the car with an empty magazine although later we found he had 800 rounds of ammunition. He had a Magnum, 357 Magna revolver uh, as well. He had a, uh, another 45 caliber. Uh, and he also had a map. And this is the, this is the evidence list. And you seem to be minimizing uh, all of this stuff. But it says, one map of Washington, D.C. with writing and a line drawn to the White House. OK. So that's what we have with our introduction to Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, then in August 2014, oh, and, and also subsequent to that, we know he has a history of mental illness. Then he shows up at the White House in August of 2014, and he's got a hatchet in his belt. No, no red flags, we let him go. Then, of course, there's the day that, that he, he jumps the fence and, and runs into the White House. And I want to talk about that for a minute. You say that he came through, in through the front gate, went through the front door at the, at, at the portico, and was, was wrestled to the ground, uh, or to the carpet, actually, you said, wrestled down to the rug uh, near the green room. I just want to remind you that the distance from the front of the White House where he came in to the green room is about 80 feet. It's, this is only 60 feet. The width of this room right here, this is 60 feet. So. No, no, it wouldn't be 80 yards. No, it's 70 yards of the lawn. It's 30 yards inside the house, inside the house. I've been there many, many times. And that's, you know, to the, to the, to talk about somebody transversing the White House foyer, the full length of, of the East Room down to the Green Room, to, to the American public, that would be half of a White House tour. That's what that would be. That isn't just getting inside the portico. That's half of a White House tour to the American public. And you, you keep minimizing this stuff. I'm just wondering, when, when do the red flags go up for the, for the Secret Service? I know you've got a lot of wonderful people over there, but this is not their best work. And we have a, a serious, serious issue here about protecting the president and his family. This is disgraceful. This is absolutely disgraceful that this has happened. And I'm not even going to mention the, the, the fact that it took us four days to figure out that somebody had, had shot 
uh, seven rounds into the White House. This is beyond the pale. And, and, and I've listened to your testimony very deliberately here this morning. And I wish to God you, you protected the White House like you're protecting your reputation here today. I wish you spent that time and that effort to protect the American president and his family like I'm hearing people covering for, for the lapses of the Secret Service on, on these several occasions. I really do. So what are we going to do? And, and, and look, this whole thing is the United States Secret Service versus one mentally challenged man. One man with mental illness that you knew had mental illness. This is, this is the Secret Service against one individual with mental illness. And, and you lost. You lost. And you had three shots at this guy, three chances. And he got to the green room in the White House. What happens when you have a sophisticated organization with, with nefarious intent and resources going up against the Secret Service? What happens then? The gentleman's time has expired. I thank the gentleman, but if the gentlelady has any uh, answers to any of his questions, I'd appreciate hearing them. Let me be clear. The United States Secret Service does not take any of these incidents lightly. They are all of extreme... With all due respect, that's my point. If, as a casual observer to what has happened here, I don't think the Secret Service is taking it, their duty to protect the American president and his family at the White House I don't think you're taking it seriously. That's exactly my point. Based on the evidence, based on the evidence and the series of lapses, unfortunately, that's the conclusion that I, that I arrive at, that you're not taking your job seriously. I'm sorry. I hate to be critical, but we got a lot at stake here. We have a lot at stake. And I know people are dancing around this issue, but I got to call it like it is. I have, I have very low confidence in the Secret Service under your leadership. I have to say that. And that's not, that's not an easy thing for me to say. But based on the evidence, that's how we have to call it here. Based on the evidence, my confidence in you protecting the American president right now at the White House, supposed to be one of the most secure buildings in the country, if not the world, my confidence in you doing that is very, very low right now. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Pearson, I, wa I want to come back. You were appointed in March of 2013, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right, so what three things have you done to improve the culture since you've gotten there? Very briefly, we have limited time. What three things have you done to improve the culture? Because that's been brought up that there's a culture problem. We've instituted an Office of Professional Integrity. We've established a new discipline process so that discipline is done in a more tra transparent and consistent way. We've initiated development training for our supervisors, for our SES, and for our work and file workforce. All right, so you've done uh, some training and, and some new positions, because I'm real concerned when that question came up, I watch people all the time, and no less than four people that are here with you today agreed that you have a cultural problem. And, you know, you, you can tell from their responses that there's an issue within the agency. Uh, but I also want to go back uh, and give you a chance to correct your testimony. I thought I heard earlier that you said that you were short 500 uniformed Secret Service people due to sequestration. I can't believe that would be accurate, so I'll give you a chance to correct that. Across the organization, the Secret Service is down 550 personnel. Okay, I'm... I'm uh, would I'm, the gentleman yield for just a second? Yeah. I, I, he, he wanted to... Would you stop the clock for just a second? The amount of people who are in the U.S. Secret Service the day you were sworn in and the amount of people that are there today, if you would, please, because these, these numbers of full-time equivalents and so on, I think all of us on the dais have a right to understand what the impact is from the day you were sworn in. Well, I don't have those specific numbers for you today. Uh, Representative Chaffis did bring up the fact that there had, no been, had not been any 
basic training classes in fiscal year 12 and 13. But we're, we're talking about number of people, and you're saying 500 I, fewer I, people. Mr. That, that cannot be right, Director. That is correct, sir, over the last okay, few well, years. Okay, well, let me tell you why it's confusing then. Because I'm looking at your budget request for last year, and it says in here, in your request, that you plan to reduce the staffing by 376 full-time equivalents. Why would you do that? If you're already short 500, why would you, in your budget request, request 376 full-time equivalent reduction? I I'm confused. Wouldn't you be confused? In your budget request, you also said that we need to be reducing the number of years of experience by five years over the next four years. I'm confused. Why would we want less experienced Secret Service agents, Director? Th th these are your, your numbers. Do you have an answer? I do know that we have provided a human capital strategy to the Congress at their request that outlines... But these are your requests, and let me tell you what's even more confusing then. I'll go on a little bit further. Is It says the committee, the Congressional Committee, is concerned that the President's budget request creates a pay shortfall that will result in the reduction of at least 376 full-time equivalents, and that this will fundamentally affect the dual mission within the Secret Service. The, the committee was recognizing this, not you. Do, do you not think that that creates a cultural problem when you're seeking reductions and you're here testifying today that you have too few people? Do you see the hypocrisy in that? I do see the difficulty in trying to operate a critical federal agency in times of fiscal constraint. Okay, well, let's go, since you're talking about fiscal constraints, because I started looking real quickly, because I agree with Mr. Lynch, we need to do all we can to give you the tools to make sure that you can change the culture and protect our president. So I started looking at it, but I was concerned to find a whistleblower came to us and said that you spent over a million dollars on an executive luxury suite. Is that correct? On the eighth floor? On your eighth floor, over a million dollars spent on a luxury suite since you've come, come to power. I don't know what that is in reference to. Unless so did you spend a million dollars or more on a conference room outfitting it, a luxury suite on the eighth floor? Yes or no? No. What we have done is spent money to transform our Director's Crisis Center. Okay, the Director's the Crisis director. Center, which is on the ninth floor. Now we've done it again on the eighth floor. We've got locators on each one of those floors. Is that correct? We That's have what the whistleblower is telling me. That the information he has talks about the integration of both the Director's Crisis Center. How do you know? Because the whistleblower talked to us. I know from what we have done in the way of installations within our office. I can't speak to what your individual... Okay, do you have a locator on the eighth floor now? We have multiple locators in the building. Do you have one on the eighth floor? Yes. Okay. Is that a secure area? Yes. Is the eighth floor a secure area where vendors uh, that... Are, don't have classified, can they go in and out if they don't have clearance on the eighth floor? All of our vendors are either escorted or have clearance, and the locator itself is not a classified document. All right, so, but it does tell you where the president and the vice president and all relative people are. It's a locator, right? It is a reference. Uh, point for our management team. Yeah, why would you need another one of these when you already had two? Why would you need another one, one floor down in your luxury suite? The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman may answer. Go ahead and answer. I am, uh, we need to have instant information for us to be able to make informed division decisions as a management team. And having quick access and the be able to leverage technology and look at camera views and look at information being provided to us real time from our protective missions is critically important to me and critically important to my staff. This is one of the areas where some of those key decisions are made and it's integrated in with other systems throughout the building. 
Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I think we need to explore this further, though. I thank the gentleman. And uh, for the director, during the hearing, we are going to try and get more accurately the correct number, because I have got to tell you, from the dais, I think all of us want to understand this 500. We show 1,420 uh, authorized uniform officers, 1,300 on hand, and we don't show that as an appreciable drop during your tenure uh, as your budget has gone up with 2,200 uh, agents. So we are trying to find where the 500 represents a shortfall in full-time equivalent other than a legacy of perhaps never filling the, f filling the authorized slots. Uh, and I am going to give the additional time to uh, the gentleman from Virginia. But if you will answer just one question, isn't it typical that although your budgets are increasing that you plus up going into the 2016 or a presidential cycle, and that is when you want to peak, and that you do have lesser requirements when you don't have presidential candidates and so on? Uh, because I am very concerned about the coming before Congress at a time when we are giving you more money than you are asking for and complaining about sequestration and limited resources. So be prepared to answer that. Uh, I am not going to take the time right now. It is the gentleman from Virginia's time. But those questions are going to continue throughout this hearing, uh, and we are going to follow up in writing afterwards. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Pearson. In light of the facts that have come out and in light of your own review thus far, had the first family been in the family quarters or anywhere in the White House, would you conclude professionally that there was a threat to the first family? Yes, I think Mr. Gonzalez coming into the uh, main floor mansion is a threat. Um, I think it is really important to remember, you know, I, I was a, a freshman in high school on November 22nd, 1963. And, uh, and all of us who lived at that time remember where and when we were, when we uh, heard the terrible news from Dallas. But, you know, in, in my mind is that Secret Service agent, Mr. Hill, who threw himself on the speeding car that contained the President and First Lady, and used his body to shield her. It is a sacred mission the Secret Service has. It is not an easy mission. But it is very troubling to all Americans that our duly elected President and his family were actually potentially in real jeopardy on the White House grounds itself. I, uh, I wonder whether you would agree that when you look at every aspect of this, sadly, it represents a comprehensive failure. They add up one by one. I think there was a failure, frankly, to take the Gonzalez threat seriously after the information provided by the Virginia State Police. We knew he had a history of mental illness. We knew that he was loaded up with guns. We knew that uh, he had a map of Washington. You indicate that that map was described as just a, a, a tourist map looking at places he might go. That might make sense, except for the fact that he was loaded up with ammunition and weapons in his car at the time. Now, my friend from Utah has made headlines and made a statement here today that he believes your reaction should be one of maximum force. I guess we should read that to mean that he should be shot on sight when he crosses the fence, when he goes over the fence. Uh, I'm very reluctant to join him in that kind of advice to the Secret Service because there is a first family in the White House. There are guests in the White House. It is a busy and bustling place, and the idea that we're going to have a shootout on the White House grounds seems to me a last resort, not a first resort. And I'm not sure members of Congress ought to be in the business of actually spelling out Secret Service protocols for you. 
I'm not sure that's our competence. But having said that, one can still conclude that the reaction of the Secret Service on site was profoundly inadequate and actually potentially put the first family in direct jeopardy, physical harm. And I don't sense from you, Director Pearson, a sense of outrage about that, a sense of mission that you want to reform and correct this cascading set of mistakes that led to potentially a catastrophe for the United States. Could you comment? I'm sorry you don't get that sense from me. I have spent a career in the United States Secret Service protecting presidents, their families, and the White House complex in addition to our other missions. There is nothing more sacred to any Secret Service agent, uniform division officer, or administrative technical or professional employee than our responsibilities for mission success. We don't take it lightly, but we do it under very difficult and challenging conditions. There is not a lot we can do in managing individuals with mental illness who do not commit a crime or do not put, our, put themselves in a position where the Secret Service can take further actions against them. We are limited by the system that we have to work within, the laws of our country. Ms. Pearson, I, I don't doubt for a minute your sincerity. What I said was I don't sense any sense of outrage about what happened. We all are outraged within the Secret Service of how this, how this incident came to pass. And that is why I have asked for a full review. It's obvious. It is obvious that mistakes were made. It's self-evident that mistakes were made. We must identify what the facts are, learn from the facts, assess and make changes, enhance training to ensure that this never happens again. The Secret Service has a proud history of making sure that we, we go back and look and do after actions after every incident so that we can apply better security measures to ensure the protection of those we are uh, bound to protect. I think that's really important, and I think it's uh, really important in this discussion, in this hearing, that we remember there are real human beings whose safety and security is at stake. And it just so happens one of those human beings was elected not once but twice by a majority of this country to be its president. And that sacred responsibility has to be uppermost in our minds. Even if that means that reputations fall, careers get interrupted, demotions occur, or people get fired, his safety and that of his family is the paramount concern here. And that's what we all need to be concerned about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time is up. Thank you. We now go to a gentleman who served in what I think fairly is called difficult conditions, both in Vietnam and in Iraq. And with all due respect, I think he will object to your calling working at the White House a difficult environment. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Bentifoglio, is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Is my speaker on? Great. Thank you. Yep. There we go. Thank you. Mr. Boston. Um, Ms. Pearson, thank you very much for your service, the Secret Service, one of the um, premier law enforcement agencies, in my opinion, um, an aspiration many, many years ago, from uh, investigating counterfeiters to protecting the President of the United States. I commend you all for um, your dedicated service in the past. But Mr. Uh, Bassam, did I pronounce that right? Uh, uh, Basham. Basham, thank you very much. Um, in your introduction, you said you went from, um, well, we have an intruder that got into the White House more than 30 yards, was finally apprehended. And uh, we have a hearing about that right now. And you said we would have a hearing as well had we shot him once he jumped the fence. And you're absolutely right. But um, I was trained in. Um, you only use as much force as absolutely necessary to subdue or fix the problem, never any more undue force. And that's a difficult challenge in itself, is it not? Yeah. But we have dogs patrolling the White House, and you seem to have forgotten about 10 other probably um, protocols you could have used to su subdue that person before they went into the White House, correct? You're absolutely correct. All right. So 
in the after action review were any of those considered and what other um, action could they have taken to stop this intruder before he entered the White House? Uh, clearly, uh, as the director has stated, uh, there were mistakes, there were failures, uh, there were uh, opportunities to take this individual uh, down uh, based upon uh, the reactions of the officers that were in place at the time, uh, and they clearly did not take those uh, actions. Uh, and that's why this, the, the director uh, has to, and the, and the staff has to determine uh, why they made those decisions or lack of making those decisions and, 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 and understand what was going through their minds, what was going on in the White House uh, grounds at the time, what was the, what was the clutter situation. They, they need to have the time to do the investigation to determine what the circumstances were on the ground. They, they had the opportunity to do an investigation when they, well, they found out that there was Mr. Gonzalez had guns in his car, he had a map to the White House. I would have been asking a lot more questions other than just letting him go. Uh, why wasn't he brought in for further questioning by the Secret Service, especially? I, I mean, just the map alone, I think the lawyers call that preponderance of evidence, indicating that he had some intent uh, in doing something wrong or illegal jeopardizing the President of the United States in the White House. Why wasn't he brought in for questioning then? I, I believe the director did state that the individual was interviewed uh, and that the agents made a determination, uh, which is a very difficult determination to make uh, as to whether the individual truly rep represents a threat to the President of the United States. Are we States. privy to those questions in that report, Mr. Chairman? Do we have access to that report? In an appropriate setting, we'll make them available. Great, great. Well, and, and um, even subsequent to that, uh, when they interviewed him uh, when he was at the White House, uh, unless he is breaking the law, uh, there is no power with, that the Secret Service has to take this individual into custody, and and that's the difficulty that they face. And and you know, I I totally agree with uh, with uh, the representative uh, that I do not believe that we want uh, the Secret Service's first action. Uh, on the White House ground when someone climbs over the fence, what, 16 times in the last five years, that the Secret Service's first reaction is to kill that person. That is, in, in my mind, not acceptable to, uh, well, I agree. to me nor to the, to the, to the American people. But, the, but there is an element of, um, oh, there is responses that are well within the power of the Secret Service to protect the intruder when they jump the fence, come in, use of dogs, for instance, um, a mass uh, going, a mass of uh, Secret Service agents heading in that direction to take down that individual. Right. But at the same time, they have to, uh, could, could be a diversion. So there's a lot of things going on in Secret Service's head, I'm sure, when we have an intruder like that. But I, um, I uh, just have a real, pr well, I'm, I think well, I'm out of. Uh, but I will say in 1976, uh, there was an individual who came over the fence apparently was carrying uh, some type of uh, device that was, appeared to be uh, a weapon, turned out to be a pipe, and they shot him. And there was criticism for that shooting in 1976. Th this is a difficult, difficult balance to strike. I understand. And I, I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Pearson, uh, you've served in the Secret Service for 30 years. Uh, have you served under both Republican and Democratic uh, administrations? Um, and, and so you know, and you have stated publicly that this recent security breach was unacceptable. Uh, and we've heard other adjectives here today from both sides of the dais. Uh, profoundly inadequate, shocking, disgraceful, uh, outrageous. Is there any one of those adjectives you disagree with? No. Thank you. And, and there have been uh, uh, some, there's been some discussion about what we knew about uh, the, the person leading up to the incident where he jumped the fence and crashed the White House. Um, we, uh, we actually had his medical records, did we not, before he jumped the fence? 
I believe we had received the medical records and they were being reviewed prior to him jumping the fence. So, we, so with everything else we knew, we had stopped him, he had a carload of uh, 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 high offensive uh, uh, am ammunition and, uh, and, and guns and uh, uh, he had a map to the White House. Uh, uh, he, he, you know, he, uh, he just about was wearing a hat saying, I'm the most dangerous person who could come to the White House. Um, and, and yet, uh, all of these things happened, and not to put too fine a point on it, uh, Director Pearson, uh, uh, there were numerous layers of security that, that he was able to flummox. Uh, a surveillance team outside the fence reportedly did not spot Mr. Gonzalez quickly enough to give an early warning. Uh, an officer stationed in a guard booth as well as a SWAT team on the north lawn reportedly did not react in time. A dog trained to intercept intruders reportedly was not released. Uh, no officer reportedly was stationed uh, outside the front entrance of the White House and the door was left unlocked. And then just yesterday, press accounts reported uh, that Mr. Gonzalez made it all the way into the East Room and that the alarms had been silenced uh, to me, uh, all of those adjectives apply. This was a stunning, outrageous, disgraceful breach. Um, and I know you can't discuss the specific details, and we're going to go into executive session uh, so that you can be more th forthcoming about uh, uh, tactics and procedures. Um, but I, I want to start here with broader questions. First, um, uh, I, I assume that the Secret Service has a specific protocol or multiple protocols for handling these types of breaches. Am I correct in that? Yes, sir, we do. Uh, and without getting into those protocols themselves and providing anybody uh, at large uh, a roadmap, uh, can you tell us whether they were followed in this case? No, they were not. And why weren't they followed, Ms. Pearson? I do not know, and that is going to be the, one of the main issues that I hope to resolve through the course of this investigation. Well, I, 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 I think it's, we've said multiple times here that uh, you've been on the job, what, for about a year and a half now? And you're, you're on the job to reestablish the credibility uh, and the reputation of the Secret Service as the finest, most formidable protective force on the face of the earth. Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. And if someone wants to do us harm, um, it, it behooves all of us to remember that right now you are protecting the most threatened American president in our nation's history. It's kind of a bad time to have something like this happen, isn't it, Ms. Pearson? It is never acceptable to have an individual breach the White House. So would you please explain to me in terms that you can reveal in public what you've done since becoming the new director of the Secret Service to turn this agency around and prevent things like this from happening? From the start of my appointment, I have made it uh, perfectly clear to the workforce of my expectations for professionalism and accountability, how that was accomplished by the establishment of a new Office of Integrity, the establishment of new table of penalties for a discipline process that's more transparent and consistent and well known to the workforce as to what the expectations and the level of tolerance will be. I personally have a zero tolerance level when it comes to misconduct, and we are addressing, with, addressing it accordingly. In addition to that, training is critically important, and developing leaders is critically important. This year, we've established a lot of in-service training for our workforce, as well as specialized training for our leadership. I've had a lot of personal engagement with my supervisors and the workforce. When I became director, I had over 70 professional supervisory provision, positions that were vacant. I made those promotions. I offered orientation to those new supervisors, and I've continued to make sure that there is no doubt that we are going to be held to the highest standard that the American public expects. I do understand when you start to bring change into an organization, there is pushback. Uh, we're going to continue to improve. This incident 
is an operational incident. Although it's being addressed as it's very similar or, or a, a side effect of some of the other cultural problems, I looked at this as a strict tactical concern. We have a security procedure that wasn't followed. One week prior, an individual had climbed the fence and was arrested within seconds. Why didn't that same activity happen on the night of the 19th? That's part of my concern, and that's what we're investigating. I, I agree that mistakes were made, and the pro proper protocols were not filed. It's unacceptable. Ms. Pearson, my Thank time is up, and I look Thank forward you. to closer questioning in the executive session. Thank, I, uh, uh, I yield back to the I thank the uh, witness and uh, recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. DeSantis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Director Pearson, you had just said that, um, that this was an operational failure. So I just want to be clear because there was talk about salaries, uh, number of personnel budgets. Um, this September 19th failure was in no way related to a lack of funding or personnel. Is that accurate to say? It is accurate to say that the officers on duty that night failed to execute the security protocols that they should have. But you're not saying it's 100 percent operational failure. You're saying that it may be, you're not ruling out that this may be a resource issue, correct? I do believe that we need to look at our training protocols and our staffing protocols. And so, that, yes, that would refer back to resourcing. Okay, because I think, and the budgets have been mentioned, uh, the budget request for fiscal year 2014 from the agency was $822.6 million for salaries and expenses, but yet Congress appropriated $846.7 million for salaries and expenses. So, so there is a disconnect here, um, and I think that, um, let me ask you this relating to this. You have a guy, um, uh, Gonzalez, all the agents know who he is by this time on September 19th because he had been arrested in Virginia. He had weapons, ammunition a map with the White House circled. So this is clearly something that would have been disseminated to the agents. He's able to, of course, leap the fence, get deep inside the White House. How many um, uh, Secret Service agents stood between him penetrating that first fence and getting in? In other words, um, were there just not enough people there? How many people were there? The White House complex is uh, secured and the building is defended by the United States Uniform Secret Service Uniform Division. And, and I how many were? You, I can provide you information in a different setting as to the location and numbers of personnel. Because I um, I noticed for this hearing, um, you, you there was a request to the Sergeant at Arms for people to accompany you to this hearing, um, and I believe that they're probably sitting behind you. Um, how many people have accompanied you to this hearing today? Do you know? I would believe 12 of my senior managers. Okay, because we had a request for 18 personnel, but you say maybe only 12, so at least 12, uh, maybe more, um, are accompanying you here for uh, testimony, which is important, um, but it's, it, it kind of cuts against this idea that, that we're at a, a manpower shortage, especially in some of the numbers uh, that we've been doing. Let me ask you this about the culture uh, of the agency. Now, there, it's, a number of incidents have been raised. You had the celebrity uh, uh, crash, the, the White House dinner a few years back. Of course, the 2011 shooting incident, the agency's poor response to that has been talked about. You did have the 2013 May uh, incident at the Hay Adams Hotel involving an agent. Miami 2014 a car accident involving agents with alcohol suspected. The Netherlands 2014 excessive drinking by agents. Some had to be sent home. And of course, what got the most publicity probably is the 2012 incident uh, in Colombia. So a lot of people look at this, and I think they think that there are obviously a lot of good people in the Secret Service, but they think there may be a cultural problem. Now, you say you don't think the September 19th breach is as a result of that culture, but let me ask you, how do you assess the health of the culture in the Secret Service right now? Well, since becoming director, uh, we have established a Office of Integrity. I have made my position known on the level of professionalism that's expected, um, accountability at all levels. I've met personally with every frontline supervisor up to my SES managers and then provided them some additional training to ensure that they know how to lead, that they know how to manage, and they know how to work with this dedicated workforce. At the same time, we're providing training for the workforce. But we're doing it at the same time that we're meeting very difficult 
protective requirements and investigative requirements around the world. I believe that we have started to make a pretty significant transition within the organization and recognizing that we have made missteps and that we need to learn from these incidents and improve. And you think that the steps that you have taken uh, have resulted in uh, uh, discernible improvement uh, in the culture? I think these steps, along with continuing to promote and support new management, will help us in that process. Thank you. I yield. For the gentleman, yield for I follow up. Yield to the gentleman from North Carolina. Let, let me just ask a follow up because it gets back to this budget question. So, under your direction, was there a reduction in the counter surveillance manpower under your under your directorship? Under my directorship, yes. I I established a new permanent division. Was there a reduction? Yes or no? I don't believe there was a reduction. Okay, because the whistleblower seemed to indicate that there is a study that recommended that there should be a hundred people for counter surveillance and that you personally made the decision to cut that by a third. Is that not correct? The, the witness can answer and uh, the time has expired. Would you answer please? Yes. Uh, I would like to review that study. I know that we have asked for a study in the past that related to counter surveillance and counter surveillance methodologies to be employed by the Secret Service in context of the National Capital Region. And we earlier this year established a counter surveillance division and staffed it with what we believe are the appropriate resources for this time. And we'll continue to go back and look at that process and see how we need to continue to resource it as appropriate. I thank the uh, witness. I recognize the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have tremendous respect for the members of the Secret Service, and I can't believe that I'm about to begin this line of questioning um, as, as a member of Congress, because it should never have gone to this point where I have to ask you these questions. And specifically, I'd like to touch on your AAR process, the after action review process. Do you conduct AARs? You mentioned that you did earlier, but do you? Yes, we do refer to them as fact-finding. Okay. Um, do you conduct fact-finding at all levels? For example, following the um, Hernandez shooting incident, were there um, uh, fact-finding sessions conducted at every level, for example, with the personnel that were on the White House grounds that night, maybe doing the shift change brief, maybe the next morning at the next shift change, and then all the way up the region, and then all the way up to the director level? Would that be a normal course of action? Yes, it would. So at the fact-finding um, uh, sessions, once you discover something that is deficient, do you then change your procedures based on what you learn at the fact-finding sessions? Yes, we would. Have you changed your procedures for when the White House comes under, a um, comes under uh, shooting incidents? For example, if the shooting happens at 9 p.m. at night and it was too dark then, I'm not sure why you don't have access to flashlights and spotlights to check the White House in the evening, but okay, it was too dark. Do you know how, now have a procedure for checking the entire building, including the third floor, either at night or the next day? Is that now part of the new procedures? Yes, it is. And again, that night, it's a three-story building, so oftentimes it would require lift trucks and such, but we do have a better protocol now to ensure that proper sweeps are done across the complex as a result of that after action. It's the People's House and the President of the United States. I think the American public would begrudge a lift truck at night to go check the outside of the building, I would imagine, but you have that procedure in place. So if there's a suspected shooting incident, it would be sooner than three or four days and a housekeeper before we find the bullets in the side of the White House because of the new procedures, correct? Yes, ma'am. Lessons learned. Okay. Um, uh, post um, Hernandez, the first, I'm sorry, the um, not Hernandez, Mr. Ortiz, the recent um, uh, breach that just happened. After he was initially apprehended with the ax in his waistband and, and he had this story, were information of that apprehension or that discussion that the agents had with him, was that shared, would have been shared as part of fact-finding 
the next day at a shift with pictures of him have been shown to the officers coming on shift on the next shift. Hey, we stopped this guy. He had an ax in his waistband. He had all this ammo in his car. Watch out for him. He may come by. Was that ever done? It is my understanding that he was initially observed by members of our counter surveillance division. So I am assuming, and I, I would have to get back to the committee, that that would be a part of the protocol of our counter surveillance division, as well as our uniform division officers that are frequently seeing these people come along the south fence line. Okay. W would that have been shared with all of the officers stationed along the south fence line or, or who might have contact with passersby? This guy has been by a couple of times. He's, you know keep an eye out for him? Is that a standard thing that would now happen as part of your procedures every shift? I would assume it is discussed, but I don't know to what specificity it's physically reported amongst the uniform division. But the information that Mr. Gonzalez had appeared on the south fence line, was interviewed, his car was, uh, he could send search to a vehicle. All of that was in a written report uh, provided and supplemented as part of Mr. Gonzalez's contact. What about um, any results from fact finding that spoke to the lack of communications between the agents had, who were um, safeguarding the first daughters um, being on a different frequency as the agents who were taught responding to the 2011 the, the shooting incident? My understanding is that the agent inside did not know because she did not hear traffic that the shoot, suspected shooting would have had happened and did not find out about it until through a, a third party, another agent. It has not been fixed. Now are all the agents listening to multiple frequencies? Our protocol would require that all agents are notified, regardless of their assignment, for that type of incident with a shooting on the complex. So yes, I would say that information is now passed through our joint operations system. Okay. I'm, I'm running out of time. I'm just very concerned that we're not learning from lessons learned, that these things are happening, whether or not the fact-finding sessions are happening. This information is not disseminated in some way, and I would love to maybe in the um, executive session or something touch more on how you're fixing and updating your protocols because this seems pretty standard to me. Um, with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank, thank you, and I'm going to recognize myself. Well, um, welcome, uh, Director Pearson. Been a lot of chest beating, and, and there's been a lot of beating up of the director today, and um, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, not just what took place, but also what we can do to make certain that the White House is safe, the first family is safe, and these incidents don't can, uh, happen again. There are basically two things that we deal with to do that. One would be personnel, your personnel, um, and the second would be uh, technology. Uh, I, I would believe those two would resolve the problem in the future. Um, since you came in sort of to clean up some of the mess, the problems with performance, the problems mor with morale, uh, I will say too, you're the first uh, director in 22 years to ever call me personally and ask for some assistance. Before this incident took place, folks, she actually called and she said, uh, I want to improve the quality of our personnel. And she asked for actually two things, uh, and they're still pending before this committee, interestingly enough. I just checked. <laughs> but uh, one was to improve the, the standards for the agents. Um, I know there had been a lack of um, academy training and not a, a lot of folks trained. But you were also, and you formally uh, headed HR, uh, concerned about the agents. Is that correct? OK. Um, and then uh, also the ability to hire and fire. We saw in the VA scandal the hands tied uh, to hire and fire. And you asked for, I guess, to, create, uh, to uh, call the service an exempt service. Is that correct? Yes, sir. It's referred to as accepted service. Yes. And, and that would, be, that would give you uh, more ability to discipline. I asked the staff the status of those, and they're pen, uh, it's still pending. There's been some objection from the other side of the aisle even to take them up. So I thank you for uh, stepping forward uh, and uh, also recommending that. Little things like technology. Now, you weren't the director in 2011 when uh, the bullets hit the White House, were you? 
No, sir, I was. Oh, you got beat up pretty good on that one today. But uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, the White House uh, and and really they discovered some concrete or something that had been chipped on a balcony that isn't examined uh, and was the the surface area of the White House is quite quite a bit, and you would want to examine some of it, and that wasn't done at 9.50 at night, whatever it was. But the fact remains that um, a window was broken. Now, that concerns me because um, at my house, uh, uh, I have a security system. If a window is breached, actually, when I left this morning, uh, I didn't want to disturb my wife quite early, but the security uh, uh, alarm sort of notifies you that someone's coming in or going out. I don't have a very sophisticated system. But a window breaking in the White House in 2011, it seems like that should, and I know there are two barriers. One is uh, a bulletproof and the other is the, the uh, uh, original or antique glass. Uh, that should uh, have been taken care of. Has that been taken care of, do you know? I know that the windows have been replaced. No, I'm talking about security for breaching that. Again, a simple thing. If someone opens a, a window or a window is broken at my house, I have an alarm. Um, have you ever heard of these guys? Okay. This is a, it's not very costly. You can subscribe, but uh, that can be installed. It's a simple technology uh, device uh, and, and company, private system that can do that. So I don't think we have to spend a lot of money. I think when we've got to improve the quality of, and professionalism, what you're trying to do, you got to be able to hire and fire people, and you have to put some uh, technology in place. We don't have to put cement trucks and barriers in front of the White House. It's the people's house. Now, do you know when the, the current seven foot, six inch fence was installed? 1965. 1965. Not, you know, I don't want to go through some outrageous things, and I know taxpayers have to fund this, but maybe we could raise that a little bit. The other thing, too, is you're part of the time you, you've lived in Florida. We could even put some veg, vegetation barriers, simple things like, how about Spanish bayonet? You jump that fence, and you'll get quite a greeting when you uh, hit the ground. Inexpensive uh, vegetation barriers. But there's a whole host of things that we can do cost effectively. So I hope you'll consider some of them as we look at some solutions. Jumping the fence at the White House is not new. That's right. Is that right? That's correct, sir. About what's happened is they went uh, beyond the barrier. The other thing, too, is I understand the president, the first family, were not at the White House when this took place. And sometimes the, pers the security personnel and Secret Service do uh, get refocused to address where the president is, and he had just departed. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Well, again, welcome to the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. It's good to have you here today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. 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 Chairman, can I just make an inquiry? You made yes. some reference during your remarks that the director had made two requests, and some uh, there was some objection from this side. Could you? Uh, expand on that for us because well, we're not aware of that. She as far told as I know. you the two requests right. that were made. Right. Uh, she actually uh, contacted me. We contacted staff, I, and we've asked staff to look at it. I asked the staff just now. I said, "Well, what's the status of that?" And they they said there was. I said, "Have we moved forward on her request?" They said, "No." I said, "Why?" They said, "Because." Some of the staff, or some of the members on the other side of the aisle, objected to that. Well, and I mean, you can object to it. I'm well, I don't think anybody has. That's my point. That We're not aware of that. The so. director has taken steps to improve both the Chairman, the performance we all understand that. We're willing to accept and the that. Qualifications uh, and and the status of of one of the most respected law enforcement services uh, in the world, not just the We're appreciative of that. I think and we don't Thank disagree you. that she did that. What well, we disagree just is telling, nobody on this side knows I got to tell it about. like it is, and that's so how it is. you're telling us like somebody told you it was. Well, that's the fact. So, again, uh, she just testified go. under oath that she did contact me in that regard. I asked staff, and that's the status of that. Well, Chairman, you okay, just for a moment, have, please. Um, but Chairman, you yes. just for a moment. Yes. I, I just want to make something very, very clear. Um, on this side of the aisle, we will do everything in our power to make sure that the Secret Service has everything it needs 
Well, there are two Wait items. Let, let me, may, yes. may, I, may I finish, yes, please? Go right ahead. It needs to protect the president, his family, the vice president, his family, the families of and the president and our former presidents. This is extremely important to us, and I don't want this hearing uh, anybody to get the impression that we are not uh, a million percent uh, supportive of making sure that the Secret Service has what it needs, legislatively or financially. Well, I thank the gentleman, and I know uh, he'll work with us to try to accommodate the request of the director. This, the gentleman from uh, oh, would, would the Mr. chairman Mr. yield? Yes. Oh, perhaps, sir, Mr. perhaps Mr. just to clear clear the record. Uh, I think that the entire committee needs to be aware that there have been requests to uh, to have personnel stand, stand, standings of exempt changed in some cases to make them easier to terminate. Now, that is a de debate we can certainly have. I do believe today uh, that although that is something the committee should consider, and, and, and I am certainly supportive of, at this level, people being subject to disciplinary action if they are unable to fulfill their mission easier. Uh, I don't believe today that is the basis under which these various failures occurred. So, um, and, and I'm happy to have a discussion later on the on the details of the personnel changes. But that was the limit. And I, again, I'm, for the director, I uh, I did receive that. I did not because we can't immediately act on it unilaterally. Uh, but I don't believe it has anything to do with today's the, the number of failures. It may have something to do with low morale. But then again, if you make people easier to fire, that also sometimes leads to low morale. Well, uh, respectfully uh, stating my point on this, uh, I think uh, the director has taken on the responsibility of improving the performance, and very key to that is also the educational qualifications, which she asked, and the ability to hire and fire people. And I think they are relevant. Uh, because when you don't have discipline, you don't have good performance, and when the director doesn't have the tools to accomplish that, then uh, we don't get uh, what we should. With that, Mr. Hurstford, the gentleman from uh, Nevada, is recognized. I want to thank uh, Chairman Issa and the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for holding this extremely important hearing. Uh, director Pearson, let me be frank. I believe that you have done a disservice to the President of the United States. Not only have you compromised his safety and security, you have compromised the safety and security of his family and the staff of the White House. The pattern of lax security and following basic protocols indicate a culture at the Secret Service that needs to change. Now, while the President may not be in a position to publicly criticize this failure to adequately protect his needs, I will. This President has far too much to worry about, both here and around the world. He should not have to also be concerned with his personal safety and security and that of his family. So my question, Director, is why should we have confidence in the Secret Service's ability to protect the President of the United States and the First Family when there has been such a pattern of lax security? I believe the incident on September 19th is not representative of pattern. As I have stated, there have been others that have attempted to gain access to the property that were immediately arrested. My biggest concern is that security plan, that effective security plan, was not properly executed on the night of the 19th. Beyond September 19th, which is the most recent incident, uh, the fact that we are just now learning from the Washington Post that ran a story about the 2011 shooting inc incident where Ortega Hernandez, Hernandez fired at the White House it took four days for the Secret Service to realize that bullets actually hit the White House residence. And that only occurred after a housekeeper and an usher identified the concern because of a broken window. Can a broken window be observed visibly from both the inside of the White House as well as the outside? In this case, the location of the broken window up against the, the 
mansion facade along the Truman balcony. It was not visible from the exterior. From the exterior, what about the interior? The interior and the private residence of the President and First Lady. There were indications that the ballistic glass had a dimple or actual damage to the ballistic glass. So how was, was that not, not recognized by the housekeeping staff until the curtains had been pulled in preparation for the, first, for the uh, President and the First Lady's return? And so how was it that the Secret Service personnel prior to the housekeeper finding that, they did not do the proper um, assessment, inspection of that location in order to identify that until four days later? I'll be happy to have a discussion with you in a private session, but typically the private residence of the President and First Lady is just that, at their private residence. Well, I, I understand that you are not able to discuss all of the exact details of the, some of the security pro protocols in this open hearing, and I look forward to asking you more detailed step-by-step -step questions about the exact protocols that failed, the missteps by individual agents, and the depth and breadth of this review that the investigation of this uh, incident uh, covers. Has there been any, any disciplinary action pursued against uh, any of the um, personnel who failed to follow proper protocol to date? That is pending based upon the conclusion of the investigation to determine exactly what the facts are and it appropriately enhancements will be made and personnel actions will be taken. See, and that's where I, I tend to differ a little bit um, because, because of this pattern of lacks security, not just from the most recent incident, but from prior incidents, someone should be held accountable. The security of the President of the United States is serious, and his family is serious. And we don't need a long, lengthy review for someone to be held accountable. So I look forward to getting more facts about this in our executive briefing, but ultimately, Director, we need to make sure that people are held accountable. There are men and women in the Secret Service that do a great job, and they are to be commended for that job. But when an individual fails to do their job properly, they need to be held accountable. I agree with that statement. If people make mistakes, they need to be held accountable. Thank you. Uh, for all members, uh, as we near the end of, of this hearing, uh, we will be going into executive session upstairs at the subcommittee room immediately following this. Uh, the uh, uh, Mr. Uh, no, the gentlelady from New Mexico, Ms. Grisham, is next. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I want to do a couple of things. I, I want to go back to many of the statements that have made uh, today, and I want to try to fast forward to the situation that we're all dealing with. And then I've got a very specific question about um, a, a protocol that I'm hoping, in, not in executive session, you can answer. So we're, we're all trying to figure out what we can do in this hearing to understand this incredible breach, but at the same time recognize that this is a a, the people's house, a, a public building, and, and to, to work on those balances. And you've heard many of uh, uh, members be concerned about uh, the, the thought that we would have sort of uh, shoot to kill first. And of course, I think about earlier, I think in this year, we had a toddler uh, breach the fence. And so clear, for me at least, that that's too far and want to create an environment where uh, we all feel that there's a public safety uh, aspect here. But I think in your earlier testimony, you said that uh, we've had 60 individuals try to breach the, front, the fence this year. So that's roughly one a week. 16 over five years. Six oh. individuals this year. This year. In, in any event, so this, uh, we know that folks uh, whether it's a mental illness issue or, or something uh, 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 in addition to that, uh, we know that we have an issue. 
And I also heard you earlier in your testimony talk about part of your career in the Secret Service, that you were at, at one point in time working on some of the IT issues. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So I want to now go back to the uh, 2011 incident, and I'm going to read to you uh, what the uh, Washington Post said about that shooting incident. And I know that we've said this several times, bears repeating. Back in the White House, key people in charge of the safety of the President's family were not initially aware that a shooting occurred because officers guarding the White House grounds communicate on a different radio frequency from the ones used by agents who protect the first family. The agent assigned to Sasha learned of the shooting a few minutes later from an officer posted nearby. Now, while communications and radio dispatch in and of themselves may not be narrowly construed as IT, I construe communications efforts, uh, particularly in the context of interoperability, to be definitely inside that realm. Since 2011, have you resolved those communication issues? Yes, and as a result of the incident, we have ensured that information is passed, even if agents, officers, or others are operating on a different radio frequency, that that same information is passed, that emergency information is passed to all people who have a need to know. So all of the radio frequencies are now, you're, you're communicating on a, on a single, or and that may be an inappropriate um, statement about how that works, but they're all interoperable. All those communications techniques are working collectively, uh, and so are the alarms. The radio systems are operating with commonality, and that is controlled through our Joint Operations Center. So agents and officers are allowed to operate on particular frequencies based upon their work. The alarm systems are now becoming more and more integrated with some of our radio systems, but we are still in that transition phase. Because I, I'm really, uh, among all of the other issues, I'm really struggling with the, the communications and the, the unilateral efforts by any personnel to decide not to have an alarm, such as the door, by the ushers, or anybody else. And I'm really trying to understand that if you're doing this continuous improvement, training, investments, and making sure that this elite protective force is, in fact, just that, state-of-the-art, effective elite, how that miscommunication could occur without anyone having any idea. And for me, it's gross neglect. How, how does that occur? How does, how does somebody at that level interfere with the protocol established by the Secret Service? I think the concern was when these alarms were put into place, the proximity to other uh, Activities within the White House, it could be an interference, such as the, the tour lines or other public events. So an interference, and, and we, I said that I think that you need to be able to address the balances of the public uh, visiting, uh, utilizing, meeting uh, at the White House. But it's stunning to me that that would trump your own protocols for making sure that, when, that you have alarms whose purpose is to trigger a threat so that you can have an effective global within the Secret Service, both interior and exterior, a communications plan that would allow you to effectively execute a protocol, otherwise you can't. And I, I know I'm out of my time, but the something's is. wrong with this. I we will yield be going back. into a classified session. I think that's going to help. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, the chair would announce that we now have two members who have been waived on that will ask their questions. That will complete the full round. Uh, with the indulgence of the ranking member, we are going to have an additional five minutes per side divided by whoever Mr. Cummings would like to recognize myself, and then we will go upstairs into executive session. So five minutes aside for our two guest members, then five minutes aside, which will include closing. So that will give everyone an understanding that roughly 10 minutes or 20 minutes from now we will conclude for anyone who, any staff who want to make sure their members are available upstairs. And with that, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Pearson, are your agents that are charged with guarding the White House and guarding 
the occupants of the White House, are they allowed to use smartphones while on duty? And I'm talking about personal smartphones, texting, tweeting, playing games. Are they allowed to use personal smartphones while on duty? No, they would not be. And that's strictly enforced? You're confident? I know that they have access to a BlackBerry, which is part of the tools that we give our officers and agents to receive information and pass information. That's an official phone to me. That's something yes. they need in their day-to-day -to, -day to say, go to this gate or that or watch for this guy. But I'm talking about personal smartphone usage. You say they're not allowed to do that while on duty, guarding the White House and its occupants. It's possible that some employees have a personal cell phone for emergency contact by their family, but they're discouraged from using any kind of technology. They're discouraged their from using. Okay, a week before someone was caught jumping the fence, a week later, someone was not, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, were you at the White House picnic this year? No, I was not. Okay, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Do you know when it was? I'll answer that. It was two days before the event. At the White House picnic, it was senators, congressmen, Republicans, Democrats. Everyone's invited. Our families were invited. We took our families. We get stopped at the street. We have to show an ID, members of Congress, senators, our families. They're checking the books, making sure everything's in order to let us go another, I'm going to say 70 yards, I don't know exactly, but just down the sidewalk a little tiny ways. And then they check our ID again. Get your driver's license out. We need to check your ID again before you can go onto the premises of the White House. So we go into the picnic. Several hundred people there. I don't know, two, three hundred, four hundred, what it was. The president and the first lady are normally there. On the 17th of September of this year, the first lady was out of state. The president of the United States was there at that event. We've had four assassinations in this country. We've had about two dozen attempted including the shooting of Theodore Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. We just heard my friend, Ms. Holmes Norton, earlier in her questioning, say that this president has received approximately three times the number of threats on his life of any other president. I, I was surprised to hear that. The president of the United States was there that night among 300 people, let's say 400, whatever it was. I shudder to think he was behind a rope those of you old enough to remember clotheslines, it was about a three-quarter inch, looked like a clothesline rope was his protection that evening from 300, 400 people. I shudder to think if this gentleman would have come 48 hours earlier, jumped the fence that night, run into the crowd, or say he had eight or ten friends with him. The President of the United States was behind a clothesline rope that night. I've got pictures on my cell phone of him having, letting people take selfies with him, holding babies, taking pictures. It's a great gesture from the president. We want to be close to the president. We want to be able to talk to him, reach out to him. But if you don't take anything else away from this hearing today, take that picture in your mind. You weren't there. But 48 hours earlier, we could be having a whole different conversation here today. And that's very, very upsetting to me. I'm, I love first responders. I've got a great deal of admiration and respect for first responders, police, whether it's the local police, the sheriff, the highway patrol, the secret service, the FBI, the people that protect us. Let me ask you another question. Are there people with automatic weapons patrolling the, the White House grounds inside or out, standing there with their trigger, with their finger on a trigger of an automatic weapon in plain sight that might be a deterrent? We do have a number of tactical assets that are deployed at the White House routinely. Are they in plain sight with an automatic weapon with their finger on the trigger, like they are outside of this building and next door here at the Capitol? And I was driving down the street yesterday here. There was a Capitol Hill policeman with an automatic weapon, finger on the trigger, very, very observed. We were stopped at a stop sign, and I said, yeah, I wonder if they have an extra threat today or something, because this guy is really on point. But I think that if we had something like that, and I'm thinking about jumping the fence, whether I have my full mental faculties or not, and I see someone there with an automatic weapon, their finger on the trigger, 
You think I'm not going to think two or three times about, just like I would about doing something with the Capitol, because I see all these people around with automatic weapons guarding us, safeguarding our lives. But again, I shudder to think what could have happened 48 hours earlier if that guy would have wanted to jump the fence that night and run out in the middle of three or 400 people or have two or three friends with him and the president's behind a clothesline rope. I appreciate you being here. appreciate your testimony. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I would second his point that uh, I've seen senators wait two hours after the Salahi uh, incident to get into the White House uh, in nine degree temperatures. Uh, I certainly hope that we won't have the kind of craziness that you can take two hours to get into the White House as a member of the House or Senate, uh, but somebody can just jump the fence and be inside in a matter of seconds. Uh, that is, I think, what this hearing is all about, and I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gen patient, gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Uh, Sheila Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your courtesy, and to the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, thank you for your courtesy, and thank you for acknowledging uh, that uh, Homeland Security and this committee has worked together on a number of issues. Before I start it, I want to put into the record uh, by reading it, the words expressed by Mr. Obama, our President, just last week as, Madam Director, you made it very clear that at the General Assembly you protected not only the President but 140 heads of state. And the President said the Secret Service does a great job. I am grateful for all the sacrifices they make on behalf, on my behalf and on my family's behalf. I wanted to just add that because the President has confidence. I also want to acknowledge that uh, your storied history equates to the storied history of the Secret Service starting in 1865. And we recognize uh, that it has continued in that service. And I hope this hearing, as my colleagues have said, between Republicans and Democrats, would alter this headline uh, that I hold up that says the Secret Service opens door to ridicule. I disagree with that and say it opens the door to restructuring and revamping, because I think you have been very honest with us today. And I also hold, since it was mentioned, uh, documents which I would asked if I am able to put into the record the unanimous consent. I, I don't know if that Without objection, the uh, entire the list, uh, reform thank you, Mr. of the Chairman, record. The list of assassinated presidents, four dead, too many, and six with attempted. That is the basis of our passion. I also want to acknowledge the Homeland Security Inspector General report uh, on three headlines that I will read, and maybe we will get into this because I have some specific questions in the uh, classified, but it had three points. Policies and procedures for proposing and issuing discipline are insufficient. United States Secret Service is not always in compliance with federal disciplinary rules. Internal controls are sufficient or insufficient to ensure discipline is aligned with agency. Now, you will probably say that a lot of this has been corrected, and I, I look forward to those questions. But let me go specifically to my concern. On July 19, the state uh, Virginia police found a man that had uh, any number of indictable things, and when I say that, sawed off shotguns, uh, rifles, a number of items. Uh, that are not the normal course, even though he is under the Second Amendment. And then on August 25th, our officers stopped this gentleman. I'm going to say to the American people, uh, since this president is documented, maybe because he is different, maybe because of the policies, that he has had more threats than others, I'm going to say to the American public, maybe someone should have known the gentleman who jumped the fence on the 19th. Maybe his family should have reported him. But I do believe that it was unacceptable that he was stopped on August 25th with the information and there could not have been some basis upon which this gentleman could have been referred to an institutional whole, uh, referred to uh, call family members in and to address the question. Yes, individuals have that. My question to you is why was this gentleman that jumped on September the 19th stopped on August 25th with a background of the enormous amount of guns and other threatening items, why wasn't he 
taken into custody. Let's not say the law didn't allow us. Why wasn't there a way that he could have been held, his family could have been called, the military is an ex-retiree that or, or an ex-officer uh, um, of the uh, military could not have been called. And I have another question, so maybe I should ask it out of courtesy to my colleagues. The other egregious thing that I thought was uh, particularly outrageous is in the 2011, uh, when it was either it either was a car backfiring or gang fights, which I've never heard of gang fights at the at the uh, at the white at the White House. I'm asking you this question on the one that happened on the 19th. The most egregious that I could ever think is that the individuals surveying the White House on that day failed to stop him. And we have a picture, which you cannot see, of one, two, three, four, five, six uniform officers. I wonder if there is a fitness problem here. Chasing this gentleman who could not capture him. All six of them in this picture could not capture him. And so my question is, what in the open domain stopped them from getting him before he jumped the fence? This is on September 19th. What stopped them from getting him when he jumped over the fence with six or more officers chasing him, uniform officers, and why would, in the 2011 event, you think that it was a gang fight instead of a more serious investigation into the fact that there were gunfire? We are looking into why Mr. Gonzalez was not stopped when he came over the fence. I've stated him publicly, and I'll continue to work with my workforce to understand why he was allowed to make access to the, to the mansion and why he wasn't detained earlier as soon as he jumped the fence. I need to understand why he was not recognized earlier in the day and further surveillance put on him as to, to further analysis as to why he was there and why he had returned to the White House. I cannot explain those questions today. Uh, in regard to the uh, shooting back in November of 11 of 11, all I can advise is that in collaboration with the U.S. Park Police, the Metropolitan Police Department, and the Secret Service, the conflicting witness statements at that night, at that time, there was confusion about whether there were shots at the White House or shots at, uh, from car to car. It appears to me that those are also documented in the police reports. I regret the confusion that occurred three years ago. I know that we have learned from that incident, and the Secret Service would react differently today than it did uh, three years ago. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me just conclude by saying, in the light of ISIL and Corazon, with direct interest and commitment to attacking the United States and maybe the President, I think this hearing highlights the serious need for revamping and restructuring that is so key when we all are working together for the ultimate good of protecting the first family's life. I hope you agree with me. Yes, ma'am. Thank back. you. I yield back. Uh, pursuant to the agreement, the Chairman and Ranking Member will divide 10 minutes equally, five minutes per side. I will now yield four of those minutes to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, I, I thank the Chairman and again appreciate this hearing. Um, uh, Director, any time there is a breach of protocol or the President's personal security has been jeopardized or the White House security perimeter has been breached, is there an internal review? Yes. And are you aware, are you, can you assure the committee that you are informed any time those things happen? I am expected to be informed, yes. Um, is the President of the United States informed? I would assume that the President of the United States is informed. I don't know. You are the head of the Secret Service. Who, what, explain to me why you wouldn't know that. Well, your question was subjective as to whether or not I would know. Well, who, who briefs? Do you brief the President or don't? If your question is when are, there are incidents that involve the President of the United States or his, the first family and security concerns, yes. Then you do brief the President? Yes. 
do you brief the president if there's been a, a perimeter breach at the White House? I have confidential conversations with the president. Do you have? Do you brief the president if he has uh, his own personal security has in any way been jeopardized? I have I have confidential conversations with the president. And do you? Those would be the topics that we would cover in addition to other things. What percentage of the time do you inform the president if his personal security has been breached? I would say in proximity to the incident. No, I asked you what percentage of the time do you inform the president if his personal security has in any way, shape, or form been breached? Percent of the time, 100 percent of the time, we would advise the president. You would advise the president? Yes. In calendar year 2014, how many times has that happened? I have not briefed him with the exception of one occasion for the 9th, September 19th incident. So the only time you, you've briefed the president on perimeter security, the president's personal security, uh, the first family's security has been one time in, in 2014. That's correct. Mr. Chairman, as we kind of wrap up here, I think there is a bipartisan call for, for change, to change. I, I would like to ask for an, an independent review. I think there needs to be a top-down review of not only security, but also the culture. And I want to refer our colleagues to this. And I, Madam uh, 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 Director, I, I don't understand why special agent basic classes, 2012 there were zero, and in 2013 there was one. In the Uniform Division, basic classic classes in 2012 there was one, and in 2013 there was one. I don't understand that. I also want to, again, go back to this Inspector General's report, because I think there's a serious Serious problem here. Let me read some questions and how the Secret Service agents themselves res responded. If a senior manager engages in misconduct or illegal activity, he or she is held accountable. Less than half of the respondents said that that was true. I can report a suspected violation of any rule, regulation, or standard of conduct without fear of retaliation. Only 55.8% of the respondents said that that statement was true. Again, Secret Service agents themselves in a confidential survey, when asked, the Secret Service's, Secret Service's disciplinary process is fair. Only 40.3% said yes. Disciplinary actions within the Secret Service are applied consistently for similar offenses. Only 30% said yes. Disciplinary actions within the Secret Service are at the appropriate level of sev severity given the offense. Only 36.6. This demands an independent investigation and review team, the FBI, military, whatever it takes, but they need to look at the management, they need to look at the leadership, they need to look at the culture and the security. I thank the chairman. Thank the gentleman. The entire IG report will be included in the uh, supplemental of, of the hearing. I'm going to reserve that last minute and yield to the ranking member. Uh, Ms. Pearson, um, I, I just, uh, Director Pearson, I, I just want to follow up on some of Ms. Jackson Lee's uh, questions. Um, going back to Ms. Mr. Gonzalez, you confirm that the uh, Secret Service did an extensive interview of him. Is that right? Is that right? Yes, sir. And I believe you testified that you requested his medical files, which documented his mental illness, and he agreed that you could have them. Is that what you told us? Our procedures are, in consultation with the uh, individual, Mr. Gonzalez, the scope of the investigation would include a, a, a confidential release of their medical records, and he complied, yes. So you, you actually, Secret Service had his, his medical files, is that right? Yes, that's part of their investigation. Here's my question. Federal, federal law prohibits certain people with mental illnesses from possessing firearms. That's uh, statute is 18 U.S.C. 922G. Uh, the statute is detailed, but the prohibition covers people who have been, quote, adjudicated as mental, as a mental defective, end of quote, or who have been committed to an institution for mental illness. Are you aware of that statute? Yes, I am. According to press reports, Gonzalez had severe mental illness. He was apparently seeing a military psychiatrist who diagnosed him with severe mental illnesses, and his family confirmed the same thing. Uh, what steps did the Secret Service take 
uh, to prevent this individual from possessing firearms after he was arrested in July and after the Secret Service uh, uh, interviewed him. Ranking Member Cummings, he was interviewed by the Virginia State Police, who notified the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, who interviewed Mr. Gonzalez, who notified the Secret Service based on their discussions with Mr. Gonzalez to have a further discussion with him. So many federal agencies have been in contact with Mr. Gonzalez. But uh, so you, you consulted with ATF? ATF was the initial investigators uh, first responded to the Virginia State Police's inquiry of his weapons. When the Secret Service spoke to the family, didn't they also say he had a mental illness and needed help? The family concurred that he exhibited signs of PTSD. The statute says that prohibition applies when any lawful authority has been made, made a determination that a person as a result of mental illness is a danger to himself or to others. Don't you think that applies here? It would be worth having further investigation in, in concurrence with his uh, interview, yes. Let me uh, just conclude. Um, you know, the question has come up, and, I, and every time I step out in the hall just for a minute, I've uh, got re reporters coming up to me asking me, do you think that Ms. Pearson, Director Pearson, um, can correct this situation? And um, what I have said, is that the jury is still out. And let me tell you why I say that. You uh, were talking about internal review a little bit earlier. And again, I go back to that whole culture question. If, you, if your Secret Service uh, members don't feel comfortable sharing information, I don't know how you get the information that you need to address the kind of concerns that you might have, because you, don't even, you won't even have the information. And then it hit me, as I was thinking about this whole thing, if I've got Secret Service members who are more willing to be whistleblowers and come before the Congress, what that tells me is that they don't trust each other. There's a, there's a problem of trust within an agency, and, I've, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this point, that really needs to have trust within it. Is that right? Wouldn't you agree with that piece? Yes, we do need to have confidence and, and trust with each other. That's correct. So, so, uh, gentlemen, I, I think she answered to the negative of your question of isn't isn't there a lack of trust? And she said, yes, there is trust. I, uh, I'll restore the time. Yeah. Do you believe that there? You believe that there is a lack of trust? No, I do believe that employees trust each other. But, so then help me, please help me with this. Help me with this. How do you, and I, and I, and I, I know, I think you have the greatest of intent. You've given us 30 years, and I appreciate it. How do you get past that? It's hard for me to get past that whole issue of folks not being willing. Members of the Secret Service are coming to members of this committee, not to me, but to others telling them things that, that, and they won't, they don't even seem to discuss them with you all. They're higher ups. And it goes back to the lady back, the agent back to 2011, when she, she was apparently afraid or thought that nobody would listen to her. Help me, just tell me how you're gonna deal with that. Ranking Member Cummings, I have made a number of changes in our management and our leadership team. I'm gonna continue to make changes in our leadership team. We're promoting individuals, we're spending a lot of time helping them become leaders and supervisors, we're holding them accountable, we're holding the workforce accountable, we're providing more opportunities for training, we're spending time doing engagement sessions with the workforce to find out what are some of the inherent problems. And so I, you said a little bit earlier, you, you're going to support new leadership, so you're bringing, constantly bringing in new leadership, is that right? When I took this position, we were down 70 uh, you, special agent um, supervisory positions. Those positions have now been filled. Thank you very much for your testimony. I look forward to uh, talking with you in the uh, classified briefing. I thank the gentleman. We now, we now yield one minute to Mr. Meadows. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to come back because in testimony here, you've been very specific. You've said 500 to 550 
employees. Chairman Issa asked you that again, and you continue to stay with that. So I went and asked for what you were requesting this year, and you should have a copy of that. We've gave, given that to your, your staff right there. How is it that if you're down 550 full-time employees, that you're only asking for 61 more? Why would you not ask for 500? These, are, again, are your numbers. And I'm just trying to find, you know, in all of this, it's all about trust and integrity. And some of your testimony just doesn't seem to uh, line up with the facts. Well, it's challenging when you start to talk about operational positions. Well, it's challenging from an oversight standpoint to get to the truth, and that's what we're trying to do. We're giving you this opportunity. Thank you, if you would. It is challenging to talk about an FTE in, an, in a full-time position. The FTEs represent 50% in that first year that they would be hired. Part of the challenge that we have had, and part of what I have presented to the committee and asked for their support on, both from the, um, the uh, chair and the ranking member, is authority for the Secret Service to pursue accepted service legislation. Hiring is a challenge for me, and trying to hire in a process that is cumbersome is, is more difficult. The agents and the uniform division officers and personnel that we hire within the Secret Service require a robust background investigation. They require a lot of back security clearance. But why don't you request the funds to do that? I've requested legislation to support me and be able to uh, identify new efficiencies in the hiring process. We put out a vacancy announcement for special agents, received 45,000 applications, and because of the cumbersome processes that I, I have to comply with, we've only been able to onboard 72 this year. So how long will it be before the president is safe then? Under your scenario, you've got to wait for legislation. You've got to wait for an act of Congress. That doesn't make sense. Well, we are currently trying to work for the Office of Personal Management and identify every efficiency that we possibly can to assist us in being able to bring on these personnel that we critically need. So is the president safe today then? The president is safe today, and we're going to continue to migrate our resources to every place that we need to ensure the president, his family, those others that we protect, as well as the White House complex are safe. Well, I'm troubled you didn't ask. Uh, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. As promised, we will now uh, recess and go into executive session. Briefly, before we do, I want to make sure that uh, the director in open hearing understands and our other witnesses who we're going to dismiss at this time. It's the considered view of the chair, and I believe with, in concurrence with the ranking member, that an internal investigation by the Secret Service is not sufficient, I repeat, is not sufficient to provide the kind of confidence back to the American people. So I'll be working with the ranking member to send a letter to the Secretary of Homeland Security asking for a far greater and more independent investigation of the assets needed and the changes needed to bring back the kind of confidence the American people and the President deserve. We stand in recess and will reconvene in a secure location.